I was big into off-trail hiking. I would usually track animals and find really cool spots to hang out, meditate, and smoke a bowl. I had a good friend that was into doing the same thing, and one weekend we decided to go hiking together, find some killer views, smoke a bowl, and talk about life. Well, we got lost. The road we wanted to take was closed, and we decided to follow the detour and see where it would take us. I should mention that we were in the middle of nowhere. The mountains are beautiful and are filled with hidden streams and waterfalls, but they are almost inaccessible due to the terrain. I have been out to the area many times and never encountered a single soul. Anyhow, back to the detour. The road should have connected with another arterial, but soon we found ourselves on a logging road that dead-ended in the middle of the middle of nowhere. We thought this was weird, but we were like, okay, cool, an adventure. We see what looks like an old logging trail and decide to take an animal trail to the south of it. We gather up our bags and let out my German Shepherd, a rescue dog and the best darn dog that I ever had. This is important, because to get everything we needed, we had to walk around my truck. We head out about 30 minutes into the trail, and we start to feel like we're being watched. It was a bad feeling, like the kind of bad that makes your stomach drop and instinct take over. Relevant side note, I left home when I was 16 and was homeless for a while. There is nothing like a situation like that to teach you how to have eyes in the back of your head. Back to the story. The forest is silent. Not a bird moving in a tree, not a squirrel. Literally, there is no noise. It is supernaturally calm. And then, we hear a stick break about 30 feet behind us on the trail. We assume that it's a cougar as they frequent these mountains, and so we kept pressing on, but the feeling doesn't pass. I motion for my friend to keep talking as I slide off into the brush and double back. I have my dog with me, a hunting knife, and some bear spray. I'm still wanting to believe that it's a cougar, so I figure that I'll be okay. As I get close to a turn in the trail, I hear some crashing in the bushes. Odd, because the forest is still silent. But again, it could be a bear, a cougar, something like that. My dog goes running toward the sound and then stops and begins growling. I figure the gig is up and I step back out onto the trail. And that is when I notice a third set of footprints, new, large, and male. I pretend that my dog is lost, and then head on back down the trail to catch up with my friend. I mouth to her that I saw another set of footprints, and at that time, we decide to climb higher up onto the mountain so that we can see if anyone is approaching from below. I'm pretty sure that this decision saved our lives. As we're hiking back to the car, we discover several hunting blinds. This is off-season hunting, and it's illegal, and most of the animals people really want to poach are still higher up in the mountains. But there was still warm food sitting on a plate. It was eerie as hell. We flat out booked it off the mountain so fast, with my dog running off and growling at the person that we now know was following us. We unlock my truck as soon as we see it and grab my dog in as we're pulling away. And that's when we notice the flat tire. Someone had sliced my tire to shreds. This is when I said screw it and gave thanks for having a sturdy truck that I didn't care about. I didn't care if I ruined the car, the axle, or the wheel. I just wanted out of there. 
When we got down to the highway, a term I use loosely, I pull over and patch the tire and pump it full of air as fast as I can. I know that we saw something we shouldn't have seen. We made it to a gas station, just barely. Also very creepy, complete with the old man and dusty cans of beans. Change the tire and then drive as fast as we can back into cell range where we call the cops. I don't think that they believed us. I'm pretty sure they thought it was an animal, but people go missing in the woods all the time around here, especially in that area. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I got home and did some research. That was the end of my off-trail hikes. I now only go on heavily populated trails with a group of people, and I always leave the name of the hike and a map along with my expected return time with my best friend. It isn't nearly as enjoyable, but it sure is a heck of a lot safer. Moral of the story? Trust your instincts. Tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. Carry bear spray and your survival pack. Always have an emergency repair kit in your car, a battery charger, air pump for your tire, a patching kit, flares, and a couple of flashlights. No matter how safe and reliable you think the location you're going to is. I forgot to mention earlier, we saw the same footprints leading from the shelter down to the animal trail we had been on. There is no doubt in my mind that we were being stalked, if not hunted. In 2008, I was in the Navy. We were over a hundred miles from any land, and it was about three to four in the morning off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning the HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice, reading numbers. Eleven. Nine. Four. Six. This went on for about a minute. Then the preamble repeated, followed by the same number sequence. Then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly, a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was, Disregard. Creeped me out. I came to find out that this is a number station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. Either way, it was super creepy. When I was in the first grade, I had just moved to a new foster home. I started having this nightmare every night about the devil doing really bad things to me. I remember him bringing me into his room. I remember everything. It's still vivid in my mind at 19. The weird part about it is I had an aerial doll that would move around my room ever since I had started getting this dream. It had a button on the back that would make her sing. Sometimes I would wake up with her singing on my bed when I remember putting her somewhere else. Ever since it started moving around, I have started putting it in places that I would absolutely remember putting it. On my bookshelf where my teddy bears were. Even in other rooms. But every single day, for months, when I had that dream, she would be laying somewhere else. Most of the time, in my bed, singing. The last night that I had the dream, I woke up to her walking toward me on my bed singing. I freaked out and ran out of the room. It's always insanely vivid in my head. 
And I only started telling people as an adult because I didn't know how to tell people when I was a kid. I have no idea what that was, but it still affects me to this day. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area with a tiny Western town about a mile away, and that's it for miles. We had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography, and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate, and so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road, over the park, above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then, nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. I still have no idea what we saw. So I'm an avid caver from West Virginia, and there's this cave not far from me that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to to get them into caving, as it's rather easily accessible and not too challenging of a cave. Although, it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is that there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave and I've only ever seen a few bats for as large of a cave as it is. Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen was that my friends and I stumbled upon a pentagram made out of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by what seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now I had always been with a group of friends. One day, I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just the two of us went. We didn't make it past the first chamber, because I just had such an uneasy feeling. It was as if I just needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all my life. The next thing to happen is that a group of us went back in and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back into the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying behind randomly far back in this portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring and on the way back out, one of my most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good and he nodded 
and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me aside privately, which is really not like him, but he told me that he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said that he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think anything of him doing that at the time, because it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyway, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me, along with our other buddy, to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to access yet, seeing as I've just been taking newbies. As we arrived at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made a friendly conversation and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we continued on. After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then we heard people. We all heard it at the same time as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying as it was very distant and echoed and muffled, but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices, and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd because it was in the morning and we didn't expect anyone else around but those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyway, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut off our lights to save battery. We remained quiet as we were just resting and after a while, we couldn't hear them anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave. As we exited, the man and woman were still there by the entrance. My friend asked, so you decided to go in after all? The man replied, no, why? And we asked if anyone else had gone in or out and they said they hadn't seen anybody the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out as we all clearly heard voices, but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later while doing research, I started putting things together in my head and realized that my friend's description was very Wendigo-esque. And then I recalled how they're very often known for being able to imitate human voices to lure prey. And it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person that I was talking about, if you knew him, he's not someone to ever make up something like that. Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. I still don't know what we encountered, but if you have any ideas, let me know. I'm not exactly sure what this was, but I saw something strange in the woods outside of Homer, Nebraska. There's an old graveyard out here that's infamous for having a witch buried there, and it's kind of a local spot for kids to go and scare themselves. Most of the land out there is flat and used for farming, but this graveyard sits on the edge of a big hill and is surrounded by thick woods all around. Anyway, one night at around midnight, five of my friends and I decided to go out there in the woods and find the grave because the one in the actual graveyard is fake, and supposedly the real one is out in the forest. So we begin our adventure trekking through the dark night forest. I was in the back because I'm the biggest and strongest. It doesn't take us long to find the real grave, as a couple of the people I was with have been there before. We stick around for a couple of minutes, just messing around and trying to scare each other, when we all just get this instinctual feeling of dread. I know a lot of stories talk about this, but it's a very real feeling. 
like your body is responding to danger before you can even realize what's going on. It's probably worth mentioning that as a kid, I lived in a haunted house, and I've been in situations where I've been attacked with a knife and jumped, and I've never felt this feeling before. We just decided to get away from that grave. Now this is where us being stupid teenagers almost got us killed. One of the kids I was with says that some people grow substances out here and that he knows where to find some. So even though we all clearly felt something was wrong, we decided, screw it, let's get high. As we started walking back through the woods again, I began to feel like we were being watched. And every now and then I would hear rustling of leaves or just the crackling of undergrowth from behind me. I told my friends we needed to move faster, but they were all saying that I was trying to mess with them. Eventually, as we keep walking, we stumble upon a clearing and we can't really see anything ahead of us. All of a sudden, my friend starts taking off for the other end of the clearing and we all go after him. All around us, we can hear cattle freaking out. That might sound anticlimactic, but you try getting chased by a 1200 pound bull. So after we get a couple hundred yards away from the cows, something else scares them way worse than us. I mean, I have never heard a sound like that coming from an animal. It was a horrible mix of the cows being scared to death by something and like an unearthly ear shattering scream. We got the heck out of there in the opposite direction. Now, by this time, I realized we were lost in the middle of the woods at 2 a.m. with something stalking us. I finally convinced everyone that we should change our direction so we could get to the road. And about 30 minutes later, we're making progress as someone spots some headlights way out in front of us that we can see on top of the hill we're on. So we start walking down toward the road when I noticed that the sounds behind us had started back up again. I turn to my friend and I tell him to point his iPhone flashlight back behind us. I only saw something for a second, but about 30 yards behind us, I saw a blackish brown figure with yellow eyes lean its head out from behind a tree and then quickly duck back behind. This is what really freaked me out as animals around here don't sneak around and duck behind trees. I got the best look at it out of my friends, and the head looked kind of like a gaunt German Shepherd. There aren't any wolves or bears around here. As far as I know, there are no large predators at all. It was a little bit elevated, but it was still eye level with me. I'm 6'3", and this thing was at least six feet. At this point, I take off. I swear I've never run that fast in my life. We make it to the road in under five minutes but we realized that we came out on the other side of the woods and we had to walk back the three miles down the road toward our cars. It was honestly the scariest night of my life. And to make things worse, I ended up losing my wallet out there that night. I've been back multiple times, but never at night now. Whatever it was, it was not a human or an animal. Based on other stories I've heard, I think it might have been a skinwalker or a dog man, but your guess is as good as mine. My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there, However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, 
one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote, or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human, like if you asked someone to draw a person but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long, and frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced-in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, 
my beloved dear stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. 
I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. Growing up, I was fortunate enough to live right at the edge of a very large nature preserve. The area was not open to the public, but thanks to the location of my neighborhood, there were several lesser known entrances that I could use to gain access and explore to my heart's content. Countless days of my childhood were spent hiking, swimming, and playing pretend with my best friend in these woods. The woods became like a second home to me. I felt like I knew every shortcut and secret cave, and I always felt at peace, except for one very unusual instance, which is the subject of this story. My best friend and neighbor, who I'll refer to as Jacob, knew these woods just as well as I did. We had several choice spots that we liked hiking to, and a couple of makeshift forts that we made out of sticks and such. Keep in mind that things were simpler back then, and our parents felt little need to worry about us. They were accustomed to us disappearing for hours on end while we explored the woods. This was also before cell phones were a thing. One more important thing to note is that these woods were once home to Native Americans, more specifically, the Comanche tribe. Oftentimes, we would find arrowheads left behind by the native tribes, or ancient cans and bits of supplies, presumably left by the settlers who eventually found the area and took it for themselves. We found this bit of history fascinating, and going in the woods sometimes felt like taking a step away from the modern world and going back to a different time. One afternoon, Jacob and I packed up some water and snacks and set out into the woods like we had many times before. Usually, we would stick to the trails or the creek so that we would be able to find our way back home easily. But today, we had an urge to explore even deeper than we had gone before. We headed off the trail and into the uncharted areas of the preserve that even our parents hadn't taken us to before. Things were fine at first, but soon we realized that the trees had gotten incredibly dense. It became increasingly difficult to walk as dead tree branches seemed to reach and claw at us every step of the way. We both found ourselves a sturdy stick and used this as a makeshift machete, chopping and carving ourselves a path through the trees. There was no longer any trail to be found, but we didn't care. We were invincible kids who knew these woods well. What was the worst that could happen? We had been proceeding like this for probably about 15 to 20 minutes when we got a horrible feeling. That horrible feeling that we were being watched. Jacob and I looked at each other at practically the same moment 
And he said, dude, do you feel that? Yeah, I said, I feel it. We both agreed that something felt very wrong. We couldn't describe why, but we both had the same feeling of dread that someone or something was watching us. We quickly agreed that it was time to head back. We turned around and started making our way back, but after several minutes, we started having doubts that we knew where we were. The woods were dense here, denser than any part of the preserve we had seen, and it was nearly impossible to move. We were getting tired from hacking away tree branches and decided to stop for a break and try to get our bearings. That's when we noticed something else that was wrong. It was completely silent, save for our labored breathing. These woods, normally teeming with life, were absolutely still. To this day, I haven't experienced anything like it. We couldn't hear a single bug or a bird or even the rushing water of the creek. It was suddenly dead. These comfortable woods that were so familiar to us suddenly felt alien and hostile. And we still had that feeling of being watched, although stalked might be a better word for it. Jacob and I were absolutely done with the adventure by this point. We were completely turned around and we couldn't even tell if we were heading back the way we'd come at this point. He tried to climb a tree to see where we were, but it was too difficult. He would have to break dozens of branches just to get a couple of feet off the ground. And these trees were tall. The branches were so thick that they blocked out the sun at times. When climbing the tree failed, we both started yelling in hopes that someone might hear us. But the only reply we received was the oppressive silence of the woods. It was at this moment of desperation that we spotted something through the trees, probably about 20 or so yards away. Out of the corner of our eyes, we clearly saw an adult-sized figure, which quickly moved behind a tree once we spotted it. Jacob and I traded one brief and panicked look at each other and bolted in the opposite direction of the figure. We sprinted like human wrecking balls through the branches, no longer taking care to carve ourselves a nice safe path. Branches clawed and scraped at our legs, arms, and faces as our flight instinct kicked into overdrive. My lungs burned, but I didn't care. At one point, Jacob, who was wearing our backpack full of water and snacks, got snagged on a particularly large branch. I stopped to help untangle him as fast as I could, and we kept sprinting, not daring to look back behind us. A few times, I thought I heard something breaking branches as it followed us, but I can't be certain. We continued running for what felt like ages. In reality, we ran for what was probably 15 to 20 minutes. When we finally broke through the tree line and into a clearing, I was so relieved I could have cried. I wish that the story ended here so that I could chalk it up to the overactive imagination of two stupid lost kids, but I can't. Because it turns out this clearing was essentially the backyard of a very large and very old two-story house. A house that we didn't know existed until that moment. Decades old blue paint peeled off the exterior. The roof was missing several shingles, many of which were lying in the overgrown grass below. The house had several large windows that were caked with grime. A single dirt road made its way from the front of the house and up a small hill, and we couldn't see where it led. It was obvious that this house wasn't part of our neighborhood or any neighborhood that we had been to before for that matter. 
Jacob and I were halfway terrified and halfway in awe at our discovery. This house felt like our own personal discovery after a perilous quest. A bit of our fear from the woods evaporated as we summoned the courage to investigate. We walked up to the side of the house that was on our left and peered through the dirty window into the strange home. The first floor seemed to consist of mainly one large room. Along the wall opposite us was a wooden staircase leading to the second floor. The first floor was completely devoid of any furniture. No tables, no chairs, no couches or anything. Just dozens upon dozens of broken bottles. Shards of glass covered almost the entirety of the first floor, as well as a few yellowed books and magazines that were sprawled open, some with pages clearly ripped out and laying next to them. In the center of the room was a single sleeping bag, filthy from what we could see, with an unlit candlestick standing next to it. What are y'all doing? I nearly shat myself in horror. We immediately pulled away from the window and saw that a man had walked around from the right side of the building and was now standing about 15 feet away from us. He was wearing nothing except for some dirty denim overalls. He had scarred skin that looked like rough leather. And his eyes, well, neither of his eyes were looking in the same direction, and neither one was looking directly at us. Everything about this man looked wrong, and not just because of his physical appearance. You know how some people, you can just feel their energy? It's hard to describe, but this guy just felt so wrong in every way. We were frozen in place, surprised and terrified by his appearance there. We stared at him for a moment until Jacob found words to speak. We're, uh, 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 just checking out the house, he said sheepishly. The stranger seemed to take a moment to digest his response before gesturing to the woods and saying, You should head back the way you came. You never know. And he just let that last sentence hang in the air. You never know. Jacob, God bless him, quickly thought of something to say while I still stared in absolute terror. Well, actually, we need to head to the road. Our parents will be expecting us soon. The man did not reply. He just stood there with his mouth slightly open, his eyes dancing off in different directions. It seemed like he was thinking hard about something. We didn't waste another second getting out of there. We walked as quickly as we could toward the front of the house and made our way up the dirt driveway, for lack of a better term, trying not to appear panicked. I say driveway because there were no cars at the house, not even a garage. The front of the house consisted of a porch, which was also littered with old cans, broken bottles, and yellowed pages from old magazines. We felt the man's gaze boring into our backs as we trudged up the driveway. It was rather long, and once we rounded the first corner and were out of sight of the house, we started running again. Eventually, we reached a paved road. There was no mailbox or address that we could see. We followed this paved road for quite some time. It felt like ages before we could begin to recognize where we were again. It turns out that we had gone through the entire nature preserve and were on the complete opposite side from where our neighborhood was. It took the rest of the afternoon to walk back home, but we made it safe and sound without incident. We didn't tell our parents what had happened because we were afraid that they would restrict our freedom and not let us go into the woods again. And we didn't go into the woods again for a few weeks. When we did go back, we rarely left the trails, and we never went into that area again. To this day, Jacob is convinced that something paranormal is going on there, that we found ourselves in the midst of things both unfathomable and dangerous. We're both usually pretty realistic and grounded people, but I'm inclined to agree with him. 
I'm still not sure if the feelings of dread or spookiness in the woods and the house and the man are related in any way. I doubt I'll ever know. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and that he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam it takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m. and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, People could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race. And he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, 
large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck. 
But that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. 
What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose and open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. My wife, sister, and I are all avid backpackers. We spend a lot of time in the outdoors. But back in 2018, we decided to do pull-up camping with stargazing in Colorado as the main goal. We're from the Midwest. We used a light pollution map to find a remote camping area in San Juan National Forest and planned to hike during the day and stargaze at night. The first day and night, the stars and trails were amazing, and we were all super stoked to be in the mountains and away from Flatland. It was the clearest I've ever seen the Milky Way galaxy, and it was phenomenal. After the first night, we all got up early and decided to do another hike, this time following a small dirt forest road through the mountains. We were all having a great time, and there were nothing but positive vibes. I mentioned that our hike felt more like a walk since we were on a road, so we all agreed to take the first proper trail we came across. We had a GPS unit, a map, and a compass, so we weren't worried about getting lost. We finally came across a trail that ran perpendicular to the road and had a slight gradient running down the mountain. Staying true to our word, we all agreed to see where it went and turned onto the trail. As soon as we left the road and stepped onto the trail, I had an unprovoked and overwhelming feeling of doom come over me. Suddenly, my excitement left me and I felt, almost instinctually, that I would be in serious danger if I went down this trail. This unprovoked feeling of doom was strange enough, but when my sister said, guys, I don't think we should go down this trail, and my wife responded, oh good, you feel that too? I lost my shit. We quickly returned to the road and continued our walk. We all agreed that we had the same unprovoked sensation once we stepped onto the trail and could not come up with any logical explanation. I have never experienced anything like this and it still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. My story is nothing special, but I feel like I should write it down and tell it. It was during the summer of 2017 when my family had gone on vacation to California. We were at the end of our trip in which we'd been driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our plane back home. We had just finished seeing John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas earlier, and we were heading back to Los Angeles. I remember us passing the golden valleys where several wineries dotted the landscape. The sun was beginning to descend, as it was some time in the mid-afternoon, possibly around four or five. We were all packed into a rental van, with most of my family members being asleep save for my dad, who was driving, my grandmother, who sat in the front with him, 
and myself, who was sitting in the right side of the back. As we were coming around a bend in the road, our backs to the wineries, I suddenly heard my dad say, what is that? Being in the back, I could only peek at his side of the van, but I definitely could make out a dark figure crossing from the left side of the road. Reasoning that I would see it in just a few seconds, I quickly darted to my side, where surely I would see whatever or whoever it was come into view. As we got closer, I saw the figure suddenly change posture from upright to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill we were coming around. I attempted to see if I could see it behind the hill, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. There was nowhere for it to hide, considering it was man-sized, so I was dumbfounded. My dad and I were both confused. As he was paying attention to the road, he had only seen it upright. My grandmother was more than likely zoned out, as despite being in the front, she failed to see anything. Both my dad and I believe in the paranormal, and while he believed it was a Sasquatch, I believe it could have been a skinwalker or something similar. So far, it's the only instance of the paranormal I've come across in my life, but I still think about what that might have been to this day. I just got home from a road trip, and I've been thinking about something I saw and can't make sense of. Maybe some of you have also seen something like this. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South, near Mount Shasta, California. It was about midnight, and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street, about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes, and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip, and, like usual, I asked my wife if she had seen it too, and she confirmed. The body wasn't 100% clear, because of our headlights, they hadn't reached that section of the road yet. When we got to the exact point in the road where the animal had crossed, we looked to that side to see if there was anything there. All there was, was a man dressed in army fatigues walking down the road. He didn't look at us, he just kept walking. It was pitch black, and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only illuminated by our headlights. We both got full body chills when we saw him because we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical and mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings, but this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. We were fully creeped out. I still can't make heads or tails of this, so I figured I'd tell you the story. Does anyone else have a story like this that happened to them? This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded like my brother saying, 
Come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. So I waited a few seconds and then he said again, come here, I need your help. But in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side and that's when I see it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted. The worst part was that its eyes were exactly the same as mine, like a human's. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless, I was scared. So I ran a mile back and the whole time I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having bad dreams. Not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event he had when he was young. To this day, I remember how it felt. That was the first time that I saw it, but I doubt it will be the last. I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute, but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm. And they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker though. I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. In 
It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country, but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers. So it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head and I pressed my ear and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway, I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like, he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror, and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us, it was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left and he said he'd been up all night, throwing up, completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life. I really hesitate to call this a skinwalker encounter, but I call it that because I really can't think of another creature that fits the description. So here we go. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone quite a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little info on my house is that although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing because there are also subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys. So sometimes I would have to let them in when they got back. My family has a special knock that we use, so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one of my family, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern. So reluctantly, I went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anyone out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. 
Then I guess I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door and didn't notice anyone out there either. I slightly opened the sliding door and I heard a voice. It sounded like my mother, but it was coming from underneath the deck. The only reason I say that is because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother wasn't in view of me. Under the deck is the only place she could have been. I can't remember exactly what the voice said, but it was something like, open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know that my mom wouldn't be hiding if she wanted to come inside. So I shut the door, pulled the blinds over, and went to my room. Hours later, and my mom actually shows up, and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was not at the house earlier and did not try to get me to open the door. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. It was a very minor thing, but it spooked the heck out of me. I say it was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would mimic a person's voice to try to lure you outside your house. But what do you think? Is there such a thing as a good haunting? I think that's what's happening to me. I think my grandmother is haunting me, but in a good way. I don't know, I guess some backstory is required. I come from a very superstitious Irish Catholic family. So superstitious that my father would pitch a fit if somebody was sitting in his spot when the Steelers played on Sunday afternoons, or that my aunt would always throw a pinch of salt over her shoulder while cooking so as not to ruin the meal. All of this superstitious behavior was passed down from my grandmother, who all the grandkids affectionately called Nanny, and moreover from her father. Now, I never met my pop-pop Martin. He died long before I was born, but his stories have been told to me and the rest of my cousins by Nanny and our great aunts. Pop-Pop Martin and Mom-Mom Martin had seven daughters, my nanny being the oldest of which all were born in post-depression era Brooklyn, New York in a small apartment. Pop-Pop Martin was an electrician in the Brooklyn Borough Local Union. Mom-Mom Martin was a phone operator, one of those ladies who would have to connect any phone call you made by plugging holes with wires. Ask your grandparents, they'll understand. A blue-collar family, to say the least, where money was stretched thin to begin with, all while having to wrestle seven daughters and their own plans. One of the daughters also had Down syndrome, and her medical bills took a decent toll on the family as well. That being said, a story always rang true about Pop-Pop Martin. He was always frugal with his money, growing up in the Roaring Twenties and being one of the millions who lived in extreme poverty during the Great Depression along with having three daughters prior to the Second Great War. Not a penny was put out of place when it came to him. He would, however, make sure that whenever any of his daughters went on a date, whether they be in high school or long graduated college, he'd make sure to give them a dime or two, the toll for the use of a payphone in the city at that time, just in case they needed a ride home. He would always say, I won't ask questions, I won't complain about the drive. Just tell me what corner you're on and I'll be there in 10 minutes. He would say this with his voice ragged and coarse with years of cigar smoke. Since he passed, every time there was a family gathering and the lights just so happened to flicker, my nanny or one of her sisters would pipe up with, look, dad came to the party too, or something like that. And nanny would always tell me that she would look where she walked as if she stumbled across a dime she knew her dad was nearby, watching her. It made her feel safe in the times that she felt unsure of herself or needed guidance in any way. Nanny passed around Easter of 2018. The cause of her death was written as pneumonia, but I knew more. I obtained my CNA in high school and was the only one of my cousins with any medical experience when Nanny fell, breaking her hip right before Christmas in 2016. 
After a stay in a care facility for about a month, Nanny was sent home and I was put in charge by the family to help her heal. A familiar face to help her with recovery, along with a hospital-issued home nurse as well. Oh, how she would swear at the home nurse, telling her that she didn't need the help. Being a nurse herself for over 40 years and then a teacher for 15 after, Nanny always seemed to have a disdain for hospitals and other people taking care of her. That is, except for me. When I asked for her to do something that she had to do for healing, she would happily oblige. And, unfortunately for my college GPA, I stayed with Nanny, taking care of her and listening to her stories. Day after day, I helped her with her physical therapy, made her food as she could not move freely around the kitchen as she used to, and that actually helped me realize that I had a love for cooking. My favorite thing was just sitting on the couch across from her lazy boy, listening to the stories of 80 plus years of life, happily ignoring the fact that more often than not, her stories would repeat themselves. We would talk for hours about her life and what she experienced, all while briefly talking about her treatment. She was getting better, so I didn't harp on it too frequently. She was 82 and was all there mentally, and she was a fighter. That was until I noticed the days she forgot to take her medicine began to outweigh the days that she remembered, until finally she stopped taking her meds altogether. She knew that I knew. I filled her medicine box in front of her every Friday, but I didn't ask any questions. She was ready, and I knew that, and she knew that. She wasn't forgetting to take her meds. She was refusing. After 82 years of life, countless adventures, marriage to my pop-pop for 61 years, five beautiful children, over 20 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren, she was ready to go. Once back in the hospital, Nanny deteriorated faster and faster and passed the moment that she was alone. Pop-pop taking a phone call in the hallway and none of her sisters in the state anymore, going back to their respective corner of the country that they made their families in. I was working at a diner at the time, training a slew of new hires how to properly close the kitchen, when I got the call from my mother about what had happened. The diner was only a mile from the hospital, but my father somehow beat me there. My father, Nanny's fourth of fifth, was the first person to get there, besides my pop-pop and one of my cousins, who had been down from Boston to give his final goodbyes, who was driven to the hospital by pop-pop, so he couldn't leave with the old man. I followed my father in by a few minutes, giving him the biggest hug I ever have, before seeing the recently passed grandmother over her shoulder. She was so skinny. Thankfully, her eyes were closed, her cheeks were sunken in, and her skin was taut. Seeing someone who has recently passed is something I will never wish on my worst enemy, as I lost so much sleep not being able to get that image out of my head. I stood over the hospital bed saying my last goodbyes before the funeral that would follow the next week, when I noticed an odd sparkle on the bed sheets, something catching the fluorescent hospital lights. Sitting next to Nanny's limp, fragile arm was one singular dime. Since then, my father has decided that every spare dime he gets from change he would collect and put in a jar. His were always grabbed from change he got from his cigarettes and coffee from the gas station before work. I always found my dimes in more interesting ways. More commonly, it would be in the parking lot of work where the shine would catch my eye, leading me to pick it up and add it to the collection when I returned home that night. Every so often, one would appear in a place where it really shouldn't, and there would be no way that someone could have accidentally dropped it there. I moved out of my parents' house in August of 2019. The apartment was cleaned thoroughly before I moved in, and sat empty for a few weeks. As I made my first steps into the apartment kitchen, setting a box down on the kitchen counter, everything sat cleanly and neatly. All except for the singular dime sitting directly in the center of the granite, as if it had been placed there intentionally. The small glass jar in my parents' house has been replaced with a five-gallon water jug, the type that would sit on top of the office water fountain. Not another coin or dollar fills the jug, only dimes. 
When asking my father about it a few days ago, he disclosed that he has put a dime in the jug since it switched over from a jar. And to my knowledge, I'm the only one who still adds to the collection. Let me start out by saying that I have a security camera on my porch. The other night, my two kids, who are both teens, came and woke me up at about 3 a.m., totally freaked out. They said that somebody was knocking at the front door. It was a light knock, but definitely a knocking on the front door. They both heard it. I immediately checked the security camera and the movement alerts, but nothing. I got out of bed and looked all around the windows and the house. I checked the back door, looked outside, and found nothing. I tried to blame it on the wind, but the kids rightly pointed out that there was none. I told them I didn't have a good explanation. Last night, I'm startled out of sleep by a knocking on the front door. I grab my phone and immediately check the camera. Nothing there. I get up and run to look out the windows, and it's clear. At that point, I looked at the clock. It was 3.02 in the morning. What in the world is going on? Has anyone ever had something like this happen? This experience really wigged out my family and I. It was during the time that my mother, father, brother, myself, and our dog, Goose, were all living under the same roof. It was an evening after dinner. Mom was already soaking the dishes. Dad was clearing the table. I was finishing up my plate. And my brother was in the farthest part of the kitchen playing tug with Goose and her new toy. The rest of us turned to my brother to engage in the game, while Goose frantically jumped around between us, anticipating her next turn. We were all joking and laughing, when we noticed right away that something was off. This wholesome family moment quickly took on an entirely different mood. The reflection from the overhead light in the glass door was distorted behind my brother. The glass was warping right before our eyes. It looked as if someone was on the other side, pushing in on the door. You could immediately feel the fear sweep across the room. And before my brother could even process what we were looking at, there was a loud and aggressive bang as the glass snapped back to its original state. We all jumped, and my brother nearly pissed himself as he whipped around to investigate what the hell had just happened behind him. The rest of us just stood there, frozen, even Goose. We exchanged looks with each other as if to say, you just saw that too, right? The room was very still and ominous, until my mother says aloud, well, that was weird. Then she proceeded to go about tending to the dishes, which encouraged my dad and brother to proceed with their normalties as well. That left me standing there in awe, just staring at the blackness on the other side of the glass door. I hate glass doors at night. When I was a child, I used to see ghosts in our old apartment in Manila. Mostly, they were just blurry figures of a person that's just passing by. But one night, while I was watching late night TV, I saw a man standing on our stairs. The man was wearing all black and I could clearly see his face. I could even see that he was skinheaded, like bald. He didn't look menacing, he was just looking. I was so scared I nearly peed my pants. I told my mom about it, but she wouldn't believe me. My dad at that time was a delivery driver, so I barely saw him. We moved to another town after a few years. Decades later, while we're reminiscing about our life in Manila, 
I told my family how I used to see ghosts in our old apartment. My dad was shook and told us he used to see them too. He asked me why I didn't say anything. I said that I told my mom, but she wouldn't believe me, so I stopped talking about it. Without any prompting from me, my dad said, yeah, I used to see a black figure of a man on our stairs whenever I came home from work. My younger brother piped up and said that he also saw the same figure in our house. Then I told him that I could see him, and I clearly described how he looked. He thought originally that he'd just been too tired from work, but then he told us the rest of the history of that apartment, and who he thinks the ghost is. He told us he had to do some kind of ritual to cleanse it. A few years before we moved into that apartment, there was a tenant who committed suicide by hanging himself on that staircase. He was a nursing student studying for his licensure examination. He rented that apartment alone so he could focus, but due to the pressure from his father, who was a military man and would beat him, he decided to end his life. Ironically, I am now working as a nurse and my brother is in the military. We didn't know his story until this very year. So three years ago, my wife and I moved into a house. It was built in the 80s, but it was in great shape and it didn't cost much so we were excited for such a great deal. We bought it and started renovation on it, which lasted about a year. We moved in and for the first month or so, it was great. Well, one night while my wife was at work, I was laying in bed when I heard a little pitter-patter. It was coming from the attic and the door was locked directly over my bed. I panicked. Being a believer in ghosts and stuff like that, I ran to the living room and slept there. The next morning I told my wife, who brushed it off as raccoons or something. She bought some traps and put them up there before going to bed. There were no pitter-patters that night, and in the morning there were no animals in the traps. She reset them and we left for the day. We got back late and went to bed. The next morning she found a squirrel in one of the traps. Problem solved. She let it out and we both forgot about it. Well, two months ago it started up again every night this time. It sounds like something small running back and forth across the floor. Every time it happens, I wake my wife, who's a very deep sleeper, but it always stops the second she wakes up. She's never heard them, and she thinks that I'm crazy or that it's just animals again. We've set more traps, but we haven't found anything. My sister recently adopted a little girl, and when she runs, it sounds exactly like the noises that I'm hearing from the attic. I'm convinced that there's a little girl's ghost up in the attic. I've told my wife this, and she told me that it's nothing and to just forget it. But I can't. I heard it last night, and I know I'll hear it tonight as well. When I was 12, I woke up and opened my eyes to see a man standing on the edge of my bed, looking down at me. If you've ever seen the movie Insidious, he looked exactly like the person from The Further, or one of them. He had very short hair, almost balding, and was in tattered, out-of-date clothing that matched the era the others were wearing in The Further from the movie. He was stone still, with a grimacing smile, staring down at me. His head was cocked to the side. From my memory, he appeared all gray, body, clothing, everything. I was terrified and blinked a few times. I was absolutely frozen. He dissolved away slowly. I grew up in a house that my stepfather built on land that has no historical significance or ties to any horrific happenings. I've never seen him again. Does anyone have any insight on what this encounter might have been.
I live with my parents in a house built in the 1890s. We moved here around eight years ago, and there have been creepy things going on almost every week since we got here. A cousin of mine said she saw a little girl in a white dress stare at her from behind a corner. Things have been moving around seemingly by themselves, and I often hear the faint sound of two people talking during the night, almost as if a TV is turned on downstairs, but it's always off. Yesterday I was at home alone, sitting in my room studying. As you sometimes have to do, I passed a little wind, and right after that, I heard what sounded like a little girl giggling in my closet for three or four seconds. I should add that it sounded like she forced herself to stay quiet. Regardless, there were no children, and it really frightened me. Like I said, I was home alone. No computers or TVs were turned on at the moment. I went outside to take a walk until my parents came home. For context, I have been watching a lot of BuzzFeed paranormal videos because they're entertaining, but they also remind me of everything paranormal that I've ever been through. I like to remember my experiences, to relate to the experiences that they're talking about. But tonight, I made a realization that made goosebumps shoot down my arms. I've always had a strange reaction to specifically the paranormal. I'm a 20-year-old man that has only really cried when an extreme emotional event happens. Hard breakups, a death in the family, something like that. But whenever I hear something unreasonably paranormal, my eyes randomly produce tears. It could be a ghost story, someone talking about an experience they had, whatever. I don't feel scared at all. I actually feel calm with a slight feeling of being unnerved. I really don't understand why this happens. Keep this in mind because it kind of ties into this. I've always had a weak immune system and it was worse as a kid. This one time I was incredibly sick and bedridden to the point of hallucination. I saw a hawk fly into my window that didn't exist. But most notably, I saw a full scale apparition. I mean, it didn't even look like a traditional ghost. It wasn't see-through. It wasn't staring at me, or talking to me, or anything. If I could describe it, it was like when the white blood cells travel across your eye as it moves that way. The apparition had long flowing blonde hair, flowing as if she were underwater. Weird because I'm studying to be a marine biologist, and most likely will have a job close to the sea, but I digress. She was wearing a wedding dress. And as soon as I saw her, the instantaneous thought in my mind was, I will marry this woman one day. The apparition then faded through the door and disappeared. Pretty creepy, but I chalked it up to being delusional thoughts of a child that's incredibly sick. Fast forward at least six years. I have a shelf on my wall that holds nerd things. In particular, a bottle of Juggernog from the Call of Duty series. I get up from my bed to do something and I notice that the bottle is missing from the shelf. As soon as I realize this, the bottle comes zooming past my head from behind me, as if somebody had thrown it. It doesn't shatter, it just hits the carpet, but I remember it spinning past my head. There is zero possibility that it dropped from the shelf. I was standing at least two feet away from it, and it landed nowhere near where it would land even if it had fallen off. If it had, it would have fallen on my desk below the shelf and shattered. I was calm, without having any reason to be. I checked my closet, which was the direction that it had come from. Nothing. My mind went, intruder in my closet. Nope, okay. I placed the bottle back on the shelf and walked away. My intense realization was that the ghost woman in the wedding dress disappeared in the exact same location that the bottle would have been thrown from. And both times I was incredibly calm, even though I had experienced someone throwing something at me, as well as seeing a full-scale apparition. This time I wasn't really sick at all. I don't know what to make of this realization. I am out of the house as it's my parents' house and nothing else malicious has ever happened to us, so I'm not really worried. This is one of the many strange occurrences that happened in that house. 
but nothing else is really worth mentioning. I just wanted to share this story to people who might find it interesting. I grew up in a strange house. There were numerous odd things that happened over the years, but this one is the one that I'll mention today. It's pretty short, but I still find it really interesting. I had my dresser inside my closet and was in the middle of cleaning it out. Out of nowhere in my 20 by 15 foot bedroom, I hear the sound of a single loud hand clap. There was that tinny reverb sound that you hear when you clap in an empty room. There was nothing that fell on the floor that could have made that sound or any obvious explanation that I could find. I remember kind of morphing into that, well, that was odd and totally inexplicable, let's just move along now, kind of avoidance afterwards. For some reason, of all the things that I heard in that room, in that house, that single hand clap while I was all alone still brings chills to my spine. I was at work today doing my normal deliveries when I kept seeing a lady with long black hair and a white dress and nothing else in my side mirror at multiple stops on my route. I quickly figured out that it was a spirit because who's going to be following a van around in 20 degree weather wearing just a thin dress? Also, some of my stops were half a mile apart. I couldn't see her face except for her mouth. I decided just to ignore her for the time being until something happened. About 10 stops later, I go to get out the sliding door when she's standing about a foot away from the van, directly in front of me. Her jaw opens inhumanly wide, like to the middle of her chest wide, and she screams at me. It felt like she shook my entire essence, if that makes any sense. Since then, my chest has been kind of hurting. It's been about three hours since that happened, and the pain has eased up a bit, so I think I'm good there. I'm just kind of freaked out at this point. I tried looking up some information, but I've come up empty. Except for references to Destiny 2 and a B-horror movie from the 90s. I've dealt with my fair share of weird things, but this is something else. Any information or advice would be greatly appreciated. My dad moved into a house in the middle of the woods about two years ago, and I moved in with him soon after to help him get around and take care of the house and whatnot. Side note, it's an old house on land that has a deep Native American history in the South. Honestly, this house is really weird. The first night I spent here, I was woken up by a woman whispering, is anyone home? Right next to me as I was about to fall asleep. My dad didn't believe me when I told him the next day. It's taken a while to get used to living in the deep woods, but something about this property is just off. There have been more than a few times where I've actually felt a heavy presence, almost like someone is standing right behind me. I have a cat who I rely on to alert me when there's someone approaching my room, and there have been times where he's alerted me but nobody was there. Other times, he stares at the same corner of my room with an expression that tells me he can see something I can't. There have been more times I can count where I'll be leaving a room and a cabinet will slam, or it sounds like something was moved behind me. It sounds silly, but it's odd enough for me to notice. I've mentioned it to my father, but he didn't think much of it. Until early this morning. He woke up and went downstairs to find the basement flooded. Somehow, the shower in the basement was turned on and the drain had been clogged. Neither of us used the shower in the basement. 
He's now fully convinced that there's a ghost in the house. I don't know. If you ask me, I think it's more than the house. I get that feeling even when I'm out on a hike. I always leave food scraps and leftovers out on the tree line for the animals, and sometimes coincidentally find little treasures in the same spot. Almost like I made a trade with Mother Nature. Once I left strawberry cake leftovers out, and the next day I found a stone with a pink crystal formation. Another time I found an arrowhead carved out of stone. It's really interesting, and I just thought I'd share. It was late afternoon a couple of days ago, and I went to put my two-week-old baby girl down for a nap in her bedroom. I had been up all night taking care of her, and I had been doing laundry and other chores all morning, so I was pretty tired myself. My husband ran to the store to get some groceries, so I decided to take a nap while Natalia was sleeping. I grabbed the baby monitor and went to lay down in our bedroom across the hall. I always make sure I grab the baby monitor whenever I'm going to lay down, since I have two sleeping disorders and I sleep hard, so I don't always hear her cries when she needs something. Anyway, I decided to read a little bit before napping. All of a sudden, I hear a bunch of static coming from the baby monitor. I ignored it and continued reading, figuring that as long as my daughter wasn't crying, I could just ignore the noise. Amanda! Amanda! I heard a kid's voice quietly say the name over the baby monitor. I froze. Did I really just hear a child call me over the baby monitor? I instantly felt creeped out, and like something or someone was watching me. Scared, I ignored the voice. I heard the static again, and the same voice say, Come here! Still very creeped out, I went across the hall to my baby's room. I saw my sweet girl laying in her bassinet, quietly looking at me walk through the door, almost as though she was waiting for me to come to get her. Quickly, I grabbed my daughter and left the room. I'm not sure if she was communicating to me through the baby monitor somehow. As I mentioned earlier, I do have two sleep disorders, so I'm not always very good at hearing her cries when I'm sleeping, so I'm not sure if this was a way of her signaling to me that she needed something before I fell asleep but I don't think she could really say my name. Maybe there was something in her room that was communicating to me. And plus, I was reading. I wasn't even asleep yet. I've never felt any malevolent spirits in our home, but I did feel on edge after that experience a couple of days ago. I haven't experienced anything else since, though. I just have no explanation for what that was. I don't particularly believe in the paranormal, but I don't know if there's another explanation for this one. On a weekday, during the time of the lockdown, this was the time when students had to do all of their schoolwork from home, I was half asleep in bed and didn't get up for school, considering the fact that my alarm didn't go off. I laid there in bed for a while until I heard a knock at my bedroom door. I don't know the specific number of knocks, if that's relevant but I know that I heard a woman's voice talking to me. Cody, wake up. It's 8.30. I assumed it was my mom because she's the only lady in the house. I looked at my phone to check. It was 7.30, an hour before I had to wake up to start school. I was still dazed from laying there for so long, so I replied, Ma, I still have an hour. About an hour later, I went to the table for breakfast, and when my mom walked in the room, I brought it up. She looked at me, confused, and then answered my question. I never went to your door. I was walking the dog at that time, like I always do. This was when it hit me. That female voice at the door didn't sound anything like my mom. I had just assumed it was her. I shrugged it off by the time I had to show up for class. But during the break between the Zoom meetings, I soon realized something. Whoever that was, why and how did she know my name? 
Later, when all my classes were done, I told my family what had happened. My older brother just brushed it off and said I was probably still dreaming, which didn't make much sense because it felt so real, and everything I came into contact with, I could feel. Meanwhile, my dad just frowned at me. Did you respond to it? That's all he asked, and when I confirmed I did, he went on a rant about spirits and ghosts. My dad very much believes in this type of thing, and whenever we bring up this topic, he always mentions that he has a sixth sense. All he told me was that it's a bad thing that I responded, and it's even worse that whatever it was knew my name. So, yeah, that happened. I just find it odd that whoever or whatever this thing was only did it once and never came back. So, I guess I'll add some context before the story. I live in a 100-year-old building, though it was used as storage for the connected storefront for around 80 of those years. It was only made into separate apartments within the last 20 or so years. Only three tenants, including myself, have lived here since, and everyone's still kicking. My boyfriend recently moved in, and he's one of those people who does believe in ghosts and spirits and demons and all that. I don't, but yet here I am. He said since he moved into the place that it's haunted. I'm like, okay, whatever, I have gaming to do. But then there was today. Today, it was dead silent. My boyfriend was sleeping on the other end of the apartment. No TV, no radio, no computer, nothing on to make any noise. The neighbors from downstairs are on vacation, and the snow outside has not been disturbed, so nobody's come around. I walked into my bathroom, and clear as day, as though it was right in front of me, I hear, um, hello? As though I had walked in on a woman in the shower. My shower curtain is see-through, so obviously I turn around and there's nothing to be seen. I sat and listened for a while. Now, sometimes we can hear the downstairs neighbors making loud noises, but never like they're in the same room, and like I said, they weren't home anyway. No other sounds came. I woke my boyfriend and I asked him about this thing haunting the apartment, and he said that it was feminine and that it has spent time in the bathroom before. I don't know what he sees or feels, but I just let him do his thing. I found it eerie. I thought I would post it here and see if anybody has a rational explanation. I don't believe in ghosts, but who knows? Also, I didn't have my phone with me, so it wasn't coming from my cell phone either. These incidents occurred when my boyfriend and I lived in Dixon, California a few years ago. The house wasn't very old, given that the town is home to the oldest running fair on the west coast, but we weren't in the newest part of town either. As far as I know, nobody ever died in the house. Our first week in the house, I was using the bathroom while my boyfriend and our roommate were in the garage. It was about 3 or 4 p.m. I got a really weird feeling, so I just tried to hurry up. I felt panicked, but I assumed that it was a panic attack. I have a diagnosis for a panic condition, so it made sense. I went out of the bathroom and turned left to go into the garage, when I almost ran smack into a shadowy figure of a woman about my height. Honestly, all I remember was hair and shadow, because before it even registered in my conscious mind, my flight instinct had me running the opposite way and out the front door. I told the guys what happened and they kind of nodded, cracked a few jokes, and then we all continued whatever we were going to do. Fast forward a few months later. I'm home alone, just finished cleaning my room, and was waiting for my boyfriend to come home with dinner. My dogs were both in the room with me, and I had closed the door but left it slightly ajar. I heard faint footsteps come down the hall and I got the sense that we weren't alone. My dogs also looked at the door. 
It slowly opened just a little bit more when the footsteps stopped. It felt more curious than anything, so I stated firmly that this was my room, and if you have kind intentions, then you are more than welcome to come hang out with us, but good vibes only. I then padded at the end of my bed and went back to my phone. After a minute or so, I felt something sit on my bed, looked up, smiled, and said, good vibes to you as well. It felt very peaceful, so I went back to my phone. Ten minutes later, the weight on my bed lifted, and I could feel footsteps across the floor, going toward the door. My dogs pricked up and ran out the door. I didn't feel weird, so I just said out loud, thanks for hanging out and not making it weird, and I went back to my phone. About five minutes after that, I hear my front door open, and I hear my boyfriend come inside. He didn't say hello or acknowledge me, which was kind of out of the ordinary. I walked out, excited to tell him about my ghost experience. As soon as I finished my story, he looks at me funny and goes, So, that wasn't you in the front window when I got here? I looked at him weird and told him that I'd been in my room the whole time. He told me that he had parked and was sending a text to his dad when he looked over and saw what he assumed to be me, since it was definitely a woman, looking through a slightly pulled back curtain. As soon as he looked, the figure let the curtain drop. He thought that I was watching him for whatever reason, so when he came inside, he fully expected me to be on the couch, but when he saw that I was in my room, he got pissy about it. We both agree that it had to be the ghost. I was the only woman living in the house at the time. Another weird thing about the house was that during the day, while my boyfriend and roommates were at work, I would randomly hear somebody washing dishes. Sometimes I would sigh in relief and think that my slobbish roommate was finally doing his dishes. He always let them pile up in the sink. When I would later go out and expect to see a clean sink in the kitchen, I would be very confused to see that the dishes had not been touched. Not a single one. Yet, here I had heard clear as day somebody doing dishes in our kitchen. We've never had any negative encounters save for the semi-scary first time that I saw her. I would like to think that she was the best roommate we ever had. I definitely felt nothing but peace whenever I would feel her presence in the house after our good vibes conversation. So I guess it's not really scary, but it definitely was a haunting. We look back fondly on it, and... I'm glad I had the experience. I'm going to assume that most people who hear this story have watched or heard of the movie Interstellar. If not, then you must know about a particular aspect of the movie before I tell you this story. There are spoilers. Throughout the movie, one of the characters has multiple paranormal experiences in her room with what she calls a ghost. This ghost is later revealed to actually be her dad, which, through some very complicated events, was able to interact with certain objects and forces like gravity in her room when he's inside a black hole somewhere out in space. So a while ago, my brother and both my parents and I were watching Interstellar. I had been trying to find an open slot in everyone's schedules to watch this movie together for a long time and had finally succeeded. We watched the whole movie, and at the end of it, we were all discussing how good of a moment was when Cooper found out that his daughter had figured out that he was her ghost. Just as we step out of the living room after watching the movie, we hear a noise coming from the kitchen. We locate the source of the noise and it's an old phone that we had forgotten we even had, underneath a pile of old magazines. It was ringing a loud alarm and displayed a low battery message on the screen. The thing is, we hadn't charged this phone for years. At least five years had passed since we had last charged this phone, and yet it was turned on and ringing for a few minutes. We all started laughing and jokingly said it was our ghost wanting to communicate with us. Watching the movie together was such an amazing family moment, and then something like this happens? I don't know. I just found it thought-provoking enough to share.
My dad died the day that my daughter turned 10 months old. She slept through the night with no issues since around five months. But the night he died at 2 a.m., she suddenly cried out. My husband and I have a baby monitor with sound and visuals, so we pulled up the camera feed to see if it was her waking up or just a sound in her sleep. We saw her standing in her crib, smiling and giggling at the side. She kept pointing to her toys and books and babbling away like she was playing. We just watched. I had just hung up the phone with my mom who was calling from the hospital, so I knew exactly who she was talking to. After a few minutes, she waved, curled up on her tummy and went back to sleep. Now, several months later, we were having a particularly rough day with tantrums and being cranky. As I sat her down and walked off to grab a snack for her, I heard my dad's voice, clear as ever, say, Hey, behind me. I stopped walking and whipped around so fast I nearly fell to my knees. She immediately stopped crying and turned her head in the direction it had come from. Then she kept her gaze there and didn't cry again while I finished getting her food. I knew that I didn't imagine it if she had reacted to it as well. My dad still visits my daughter, his only grandchild, and it couldn't make me any happier. When I was younger, I had an imaginary friend. We would color together, watch TV, dance, sing. My mother thought that it was normal for a five-year-old, so nothing more was made of it. When I was 10 years old, I walked in on my mother flipping through an old family photo album of black and white pictures from the 60s. She came across one that looked exactly like my imaginary friend. I told my mom, hey, that's the girl I play with. My mom turned white as a ghost. She tried to ignore it until she turned a couple of pages again and I pointed it out again saying, look, there she is again. My mom then told me that the little girl in the photos was her sister who had died in the bedroom that was now mine. I learned her name, her age, and so much more about her. She's still around 14 years later. I feel her presence a few times a week and she enters my dreams sometimes to talk to me. When I meditate, she will make an effort to communicate with me as well. I own some of her things from when she was alive. A watch, her library card, a hair bow, her kindergarten diploma, and a little doll. I adore her, and I hope she sticks around until my end comes too. I've come here because where I am right now, it's four in the morning and the only person I know awake doesn't believe me. My cat was crying at me like she usually does when she's hungry. So I took her downstairs to get her something to eat. But on the way back upstairs, I looked into my living room and I swear in the top left corner of the door frame, there was this white face that looked straight at me and then moved behind the wall where I couldn't see it. I practically fell over on my way back upstairs, scared out of my mind. I called a friend who responded with, I didn't ask. I'm still sitting in my room with the light on. Nothing like this has happened before, and I'm quite frankly terrified. Like, what do I do? I'm usually quite skeptical when it comes to things like this, but I can't deny what just happened. To be honest, I think I'm just telling you out of the stress, and I needed someone to acknowledge what just happened to me. What on earth do I do? Ever since I was little, I would randomly hear this chiming sound. It's like three notes, A flat, C, and D flat, played in that order and like a pedal was pressed. 
It's like a wind bell, a bottle being blown, or something similar. And it's a fairly high sound. I think it's a bit more long and has more notes. I'm not even sure if those are the notes I keep hearing, but it's just to give you an idea of what they sound like together. It happens randomly. There can be a few days to years in between, and it doesn't matter where I am, whether I have any electronics near or on, who I'm with, what the weather's like, anything. I would consider it being some kind of brain fart or even an auditory hallucination. If it wasn't for my current boyfriend, my parents, and even some of my friends hearing it too. For all I know, it only happens when they're with me. It's been gnawing away at me since I can't ever seem to pinpoint where it comes from or why it happens. Has anyone here heard of something similar? I have two younger sisters. I wanted to share a story that we all share, that is still brought up in my family today and regarded with fear. When we were kids, I had my own room. My two little sisters had to share theirs, and one night we thought it would be fun to trade rooms. I was around 11, and they were 8 and 7. We'll call them Kate, the 8-year-old, and Alice, the 7-year-old. We set up our blankets and pillows in each other's beds. Kate slept on the floor next to Alice on my bed. I fell asleep alone in their room and all was well. But the next morning, something seemed wrong. My sisters looked terrified and said that they never wanted to trade rooms again. I asked them why not. Apparently they had stayed up very late, chatting and giggling with each other, probably joking about something silly knowing them, when Kate had suddenly gone silent. Alice turned over in the bed and saw what she described as a very tiny man with a head like a sideways football. She said that it was standing in the doorway looking back at them. It just stared for a few moments and they were too scared to respond. Finally, it took some steps toward them and Kate freaked out. Alice said that Kate threw her pillow at it and it ran away. It's hard to get more details from them because as we grew older, Kate became estranged from the family, and Alice remembers it but is too afraid to talk about it. It still makes me shake because they both saw it, and their reactions were not at all typical of their behavior. I have to wonder, why was it coming to my room? My daughter is five years old and has told my wife and I consistently about a thing she sees early in the morning. She mentions that it's always laying on the floor. It looks like either my wife or I with long hair wrapped in a bun, really long legs and feet. It just lays there looking at her and whispering. She says that it'll just say, psst, and not do anything else. She says that she's too scared to call for us so she tells us in the morning. I have no idea what she's describing. Chances of this just being an active imagination of a child are probably high, but it's still really disturbing. I slept in her room last night with no issue. I set up a baby monitor in the room and told her to yell if she sees it again. I'm going to sleep in her room more often for the next while, just to see what happens. I wish I knew what this was. I grew up in a farmhouse that was built in the early 1800s. I lived there with my brother and my parents until I was about 10. I was young, so some of my experiences seem very foggy, but I'm going to share my experiences and the families as best I can. A little backstory on the house. Multiple people had been killed there. A lady was shot behind our garage and someone fell down our steps and snapped their neck. 
That's basically all I know about the house. It was located in the middle of nowhere, with woods behind it, and a very old house and a garage that was visible. Our farmhouse was two stories, with a dirt basement that had walls that were still made out of lead. One time, our brother woke up late at night. His room was on the second story, facing our backyard. Outside his window was the roof of our porch, and for some reason, he opened his curtains. He spotted a lady waving her arms back and forth over and over on the roof of the porch. He was young, so you can pretty much expect his reaction. My sister, who didn't live with us but often slept over, fell asleep on our couch in the living room one night. She woke up late into the night. Our living room was connected to our dining room and saw by the computer, which was right next to the couch, the apparition of a little girl who was staring at her. She didn't give many details, but she said that she ran up the stairs to my room and hid on top of my bunk bed. My mom had more encounters than anybody. My mom is a very spiritual individual. She feels very connected to the spiritual realm. When we began moving out of the farmhouse, she believes the spirits became angry with her and our family. She woke up one morning and she switched her position to face the doorway to her room. She saw a dark figure staring straight at her. She claimed this felt as if it had gone on for minutes. Out of nowhere, the figure leaped in one swift motion straight to her and suddenly disappeared. The thing about my childhood home is that I never felt alone. I don't know if this was a good thing or a bad thing, but something was there. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place the dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the pines that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades up until the 90s and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. And there were a few stories about people who displeased him suddenly disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forestry to camp, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated. But the vibe was always the same. That straight-up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to visit. There would be 44-gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but Dad didn't seem concerned. On a trip when I was a teenager, it got strange real quick. My friends and I were all piled into my Dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spikes, so Dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us all out. We drove onto the property, and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy, slumped against a log, hat over his face, taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural, uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sat if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday, and even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of on the property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us get out of the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back through, we would stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up, as he just drove through the forest a bit. 
And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, never having moved an inch, still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to my dad to stop, reminding him of his promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors, and drove off the farm much faster than he'd ever driven on those dirt back roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best and dangerous at worst. Dad denied that any of the events of that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious as heck about what was going on out there. So, a few months later, we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without Dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual. My mates jumped out of the car but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut was to get out, but I'd spent two hours finding the place, and I was going to explore it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert. It felt like somebody could be back at any minute, or that they had never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire, hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby's sock, tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another, then a shirt, then a ribbon from a child's hair, all sitting right beside the ashes on the ground next to a women's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off. I rounded up my mates to get out of there. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. And there's no way that anything good had come from having children's clothes right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our stuff and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, but he just shook it off, saying that weird stuff happens out there all the time. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes, but I can tell you that I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father ever again. This is a very long story, but it's worth telling and I hope I can find some answers. I live in the state of Georgia in a rural town not too far from a major city. There's a set of woods that's behind our house and it divides two neighborhoods. It's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. show up seemingly without warning. I should mention that it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there impossible. One night, I was taking our dog out. He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. For some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out. Very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Not thinking about it, we pushed onward. After he tinkled, we walked back. 
This is when I noticed it, or rather heard it, the crunching of leaves. At first I thought it was one of the dozen cats on our property, until I realized that it was matching my steps. If I walked, it would walk. If I stopped, it stopped. There's a small clearing between the woods where one of the sheds is, and that's when we saw it. My dog was the first to see something, and then I saw some creature of some kind. It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. My dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast that I dropped his leash. He ran in the door, whining. I was quickly behind him. Once we were inside, I bolted the door, and I ran to tell my girlfriend what had happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying that it was probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door. As we walked toward the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away. As we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer and closer until it was maybe 20 feet away, but still nothing. No eyes, not even an animal call, just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house. I decided to check with the neighbors to see if maybe one of their many dogs had gotten out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbor, who we'll call Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for, but he was curious, so he came to investigate. This is when I noticed that whatever this thing was had followed me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind his house. Gun in hand, we went into the backyard scanning for something. We could hear it rustling, or maybe running, about a hundred yards away in the thick, swampy woods. Way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. And then, it stopped. It was dead silent. Scanning and on edge, we hear and see nothing. And then, bam. All of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard that it rocked it back and forth. Dave, scared shitless, shot randomly at, well, nothing. We never saw it. We never heard it get close to us. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick too thick to run in, so what teleported silently in front of us and slammed into the gate? Spooked, we were about to run, but then we heard it. It was human in nature, but not English. A language sounded alien-like, but not a known language, that's for sure. Dave, a hunter for the last 40 years, still to this day cannot explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, we bolted. He covered me and I ran to the house. Not 10 minutes later, we both hear a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power. I ran outside to see what it was and of course, nothing. But when Dave came out and confirmed that he felt the same thing, we were both once again terrified. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac and they all agreed that the blast sound that they heard came from behind our house. 911 was called and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched. The responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. They took the report and left. To this day, we're still not sure what that encounter was. Also, Dave doesn't go outside at night anymore. That's how bad it spooked him. The next night, earlier in the day, my mother-in-law and a police officer for a town 40 minutes away installed two motion-activated trail cams along the wood's edge. They were brand new. Keep that in mind. Thinking maybe we would see something, we waited for nightfall. Later that evening, I went outside to feed our outdoor cats. That's when I heard it again, rustling. This time, not taking any chances, I ran inside and told everyone what I heard. They all piled by the back door and urged me to go out there and look. Reluctantly, I agreed. I took my flashlight and walked to the edge of the woods. Knowing that there was a trail cam covering this area, 
I figured if it got me, it would be on camera and my sacrifice wouldn't be for nothing. As I got to the wood's edge, I could still hear it rustling. I'm shaking at this point because I could tell it was maybe less than 15 yards in front of me. Everyone at the door was just watching me and could hear this thing. And then it was quiet. For a moment, it was gone. Or so I thought. Just as I'm scanning with my flashlight, trying desperately to see a normal woodland creature so I can laugh this whole thing off, boom, something fell out of a tree and hit the ground so hard that it shook the soil beneath my feet. It was so close that I was sure it was going to lunge out of the brush and snag me. I dropped my flashlight and ran the hundred yards back to the house in what felt like two seconds. I just kept screaming, get in the house, get the F in the house as everyone was already scampering inside. They had heard and felt the thud too. Our neighbor Dave called my mother-in-law to ask what that loud crash was. For him to have heard it from well over 700 yards away is insane to me. Once the adrenaline died down, we realized that this happened right next to the trail camp. Problem solved, right? We got the evidence of this thing. The next morning, we checked the SD cards on the trail cam. Both of the cams had videos up until 11.47 p.m. The rest is corrupted. They were brand new trail cameras and brand new SD cards. We reset everything and set them back up. And to this day, we've still never encountered the creature again or caught anything on camera. My wife and I have been having a lot of paranormal activity. After moving into a wooded area just outside of Pittsburgh, everything started. Our house is isolated from the neighborhood. That only makes the fear of something terrible happening even worse. I would like to point out that my wife and I are logical, rational thinkers who are educated to some degree. Since we can't explain these events and we fear ruining people's perception of our family, we've turned to all of you. All of these experiences have happened while sober and within the past two years. There's a lot, so please give us a chance and let us know what you might think it is. Incident one. First things first, animals dying in the wild is common, duh. But hearing the screams of struggle and pain, almost as if the animal is being tortured, I don't know if that's normal but the sound sends chills down my back. This incident happens frequently. Incident two. When we're walking in the woods, accompanied by my wife and kids, I stumble upon a small clearing in the trees. Under the leaves were children's shoes, shoes that were worn out as if they'd been there for a very long time. Incident three. This one is hard to believe, and trust me, I know. I was in denial and didn't tell my wife what I had seen for weeks because it just sounded so fake, and I didn't want to catch any flack for seeing whatever it was. Smoking a cigarette out of the second floor bathroom window last fall while scrolling on my phone, I had that feeling as if someone is staring at you. I glanced away from my phone to look. I caught in my peripheral vision a humanoid type being. I use peripheral because before I could really focus on it to see it, it bolted into the woods behind my house on the east side. I was completely caught off guard and terrified. I didn't even watch it run into the woods. I looked straight ahead and acted like I'd never seen it, like a deer in headlights. I acted like scared prey. This creature was not human, and that's why I was so deeply terrified. It was tall and had shoulders and a head no hair, and a color of skin that I couldn't really make out, but it just wasn't normal, you know? It's weird because my brain didn't know what to do. I couldn't process it fast enough. I just stared completely ahead and stayed straight, completely frozen from fear. Hearing the strides this thing had was unexplainable, and the speed that it had, rilling through with such ease in the middle of the night in the woods, is beyond human. 
I don't know what it was. Months go by. I was in the same bathroom window where my wife and I tend to smoke when we don't want to go outside at night. We opened the window to smoke, but it sounded like it was pouring rain. Both of us were completely confused because no water was falling from the sky at all. I walked downstairs to go outside to try to understand what was happening. The garden hose was on and the handle was pushed into the dirt, shooting water into the trees above, making a surprisingly loud raining sound. We have no idea how that happened. Incident number five. This is another ongoing incident. Basically, we always feel watched at night. In the daytime, the woods are normal and somewhat peaceful, but at night, it's totally different. You have that constant eerie feeling that you're being watched. Incident six. At this moment, we've become interested and are sitting by our window every night trying to find explanations as to what humanoid thing that was. We were in mid-conversation on a random subject when a loud crack came from the ground right below us. The noise was loud enough and close enough to make both of us jump. We were super scared and locked the window and decided to stop for the night. It sounded like a bat or an axe, maybe, hitting a tree really, really hard. From the humanoid creature to this loud sound, we've become so afraid that we actually have our children sleep in our room. Incident number seven. As we were laying in our bed, my wife woke me up at 2 a.m., freaking out, saying that she smelled burning plastic and thought that something was on fire. We have a two-story house and had our bedroom window cracked. We looked outside where we thought the smell was coming from. That's when we saw a lit up triangular shaped thing in the back of the house, deep into our woods. It was orange lights and blue lights and orbs next to it. You could see shadows of people walking around this thing. We immediately thought of a cult. We were so scared we were about to call the cops, but doubt set in when we double checked the window. So we never ended up telling anybody. Incident number eight. After all of this, we still have to stay active, so we went on a walk one evening with the children around the neighborhood. Noticing that the sun was setting, we headed home. Obviously, this place is weird, so who would want to be outside in the dark? We got to our gravel driveway, which is about a hundred yards, tall trees on one side and bushes and smaller trees on the other. As we're walking about 15 feet onto the driveway, we notice bats flying down left to right and right to left. We'd only ever seen up to this point maybe a couple in our yard, feeding off the bugs, I guess. I started to walk down the driveway. My wife stayed behind, opposing this idea. The farther down I got, the scarier it became. I had completely underestimated the amount of bats. I started running because my children became frightened. As I start running, Bats, and I'm not kidding, began to line their flight path with my head. They would turn away probably five feet from my face, maybe closer. This was completely terrifying. As I'm trying to avoid these demons, I hear my wife screaming as she flies past me and beats me home. My daughter, on the verge of tears, was saying that she was so scared she thought she was going to pee her pants. Now, before everybody loses their mind, I know that bats are docile and pose absolutely no threat to humans despite rabies. These bats were not acting like normal docile bats, which is why this was so weird. I cannot explain why or how it happened, but it was as though something went off in their brains that just said, attack, or at least make us really afraid. They came in a line at us and then veered off right at the last. I've certainly never heard of that happening, and I know that's not normal. So we didn't treat them like docile bats because they weren't acting like docile bats. Incident number nine. I didn't personally see this, but it was weird and doesn't add up, so I'll include it. One Sunday, my parents were over for dinner. When I came back down to talk to my wife, I said, yo, my mom said she saw some chubby girl with a black sundress come out of the woods, walk in the tree line, and then go further down. This lady came out of the north side of the house, like east-northeast. 
I know it's hard to picture if you don't know what the property looks like, but that's what happened. The odd part of this is that the northern tree line of the property is pretty rough terrain. Steep hills, torn bushes, loose soil. It would be hard to hike it, let alone in a sundress. Although about a mile and a half north through the woods, you do pop out right outside of a small town. So I suppose it could be rational, but it still seemed really odd with everything happening. Most people wouldn't go hiking through that kind of terrain dressed like she was. The last incident, so far anyway, is that if either one of us goes to smoke at night at the window in our bathroom, we always hear this kind of bell. It kind of sounds like a symbol. Being skeptical, we thought it was wind chimes. We've looked though, and there are no wind chimes at my neighbor's house. It's the only neighbor we have for about 200 feet in between each other on our south side. The bells are coming from the southeast side of the property. And this is something else that we cannot explain. We're pretty scared. And as you can tell, it's pretty unbelievable what's going on. We don't really know what to do. All these weird things just keep happening. And we're afraid that it could escalate or take a turn for the worse. It's already overwhelming. So overwhelming that it's the only thing we've been able to talk about for a long time now. Anyway, if any of you have any idea what could be going on, let us know. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking or having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also not religious at all and found things like faith or hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid 70s. My mom was born in 65 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts as well remember this happening, but nobody knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother and my grandmother were all there and very excited about this. Where we're from, my family is more accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around, as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they're all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they had brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There were nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. 
Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted to something dark. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman that she is, soothed her children and told them that it was just left by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least, no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they really began to panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep inside the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate within them. It was everywhere and constant as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at that moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was in fact the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw it all into the car. They had no care for the things that they were packing up due to their fear food was all over the trunk, items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends, but one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children, or even my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them never to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day. Now I can't and I regret it greatly. 
By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members and I mostly lost contact with him, outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older and once I learned of all of the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me and this story still haunts me. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I am one of the only people in my family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. This isn't the only strange story from my family, but it is definitely the strangest. I wish I had answers, but I hope you all find the story as fascinating as I do. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005, when I was about 13 years old. It took place in rural Texas. The town itself was really small back then, and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about a thousand acres, I think, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but it also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. The car was so uncomfortable. I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone lease it that year and that the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life, I had been in scouts for a couple of years, and I spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So, after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin and crapped on the floor. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out and then setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour, maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they'd been rooting, so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land, so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there, not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're, we're hunters. This is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. 
Weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and what looked to be ski pants. Now, this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again. No reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnapped the clip to his pistol holder. That's all we had at the time since we were only scouting the area. The rifles were back at the cabin. We approached the person's right side, and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man, all while talking to him, asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man, and my dad stood straight up with a really confused look on his face. I called out and said, what's wrong? He called back saying, it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring, and as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new. No dust, sap, bird droppings, or signs of being outside for more than a day at the most. At that moment, I looked at my dad and I could see him get worried. Almost immediately after, I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched and I knew that my dad felt it too. I wanted to start crying. I remember feeling suddenly like I was so scared. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified, so it felt like an eternity but in reality, it was probably only about 45 minutes max. After returning, we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said that he had never had an issue with people on his property because it was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there that we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home, we talked and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling, but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping. Turns out that next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found a trace of anyone including the mannequin. One day, I went to my friend Nicole's house with my friend Crystal. While I was there, Nicole tells me this story and asks what I think it is. For anonymity, I'll change out some names, and for context, Nicole, Nicole's boyfriend John, and Crystal all work together. I hope this isn't too confusing, but I'm curious as to what you think. Nicole parked her car at work one day and saw John and Crystal having a smoke together. John was facing Nicole, and Crystal was facing John with her back to Nicole. Nicole went upstairs to her desk and everyone was asking where Crystal was. She said she was downstairs, having a smoke with John. John comes up and goes to his desk. She asks him where Crystal was, and he said he didn't know. She asked him who he was standing with, and he said no one. Nicole then gets a text from Crystal, saying she was going to be late and could she tell their boss. Nicole starts freaking out because she knows she saw Crystal downstairs. She described her in detail, hair up in a top knot, white long sleeved shirt, black leggings and black sandals, with her purse hanging from her right elbow. To be clear, Crystal was just married and John is not her type, so that can be eliminated as a possibility of lying and cheating. I asked Crystal what she was doing while Nicole saw her with John and she said she was sleeping at home. She also said that she lost those black sandals on vacation a few months back. My mind goes to a few places. Number one, how stressed are you? Your mind can play tricks if you're not feeling well. 
two, astral projection, since Crystal was sleeping. Three, residual energy, since this is something that happens frequently. Four, Crystal's mother? Crystal is the spitting image of her mom. Her mom passed many years ago. John's dad went into the hospital the evening I was there, and the event happened a few days prior. Or, a doppelganger wearing the missing shoes. Now something else super freaky happened that night when I was at her place. The night she told me this story. I was getting ready to read Nicole's tarot cards and I went to the bathroom to wash my hands. When I came back, Nicole had my cards out already and was shuffling. Anyone who is familiar with tarot knows that you do not touch the cards until they're handed to you and she had never done this before. I did leave them out for that crazy moon about a month ago, and they've gotten a lot stronger from it, so their pull to touch them is overwhelming. But still, she knows better. I had previously explained the rules to her of how I read tarot for everyone's safety, so I have no idea what possessed her to do that. I sat and took them back and began to shuffle, but the energy was off like really off. Her dog was chill all night, but the second I began to lay her cards, after giving them back for her to shuffle, he began to bark at the sliding door that led to her balcony. We're talking over 10 stories here, so no one is there. No birds, no other animals, nothing. I started to become unsettled since the off feeling was getting stronger. We tried to shush him and settle him, but nothing was working. I decided to put the cards away since there was something amiss going on. From what I saw of her reading, it was a very good one, but there was something else stopping me from reading her. I urged her to smudge the house and everyone in it, and once that was done, I felt better. The next day, I am so freaking sick. Coughing, sore throat, nauseous, weak body. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I can't drink anything. This lasted for two days and I'm on the mend now, but still not a hundred percent. So what in the world did she see? What was going on? Does anyone have any idea? I am at a total loss. I'm definitely not going to touch my cards until I'm 100% well again and do a cleansing on them. I will eventually ask the question, but I wonder if you may have some input as to what happened that night and what Crystal saw before. For some background, Early in my childhood, we moved around a few times, but it was in the same general area, so I never had to change schools. The first seven to eight years was in a home my dad built himself. He was a builder, and the area was very bad. Mosquitoes were everywhere. The terrain outside was great. There was a creek and forest area for me to play in. It was huge, and eventually we decided to move out. We rented a place a few minutes away, but we kept working on that house, patching it up for selling it, and eventually we moved into another place. My dad stayed in that house for a bit to work on it some more, so my brother made the decision of living with my mom or my dad. He chose to live with my dad, and I stayed with my mom. My brother would occasionally come over, but I had to sleep in my mom's room when that happened, because we shared the same room, but never slept in it together. On the night of this encounter, I was sleeping in my room, alone. I rolled over in the bed and saw that across the room, there was a figure. I was horrified. I remembered that my brother wasn't there. The bed was made, and again, we never slept there together. The sheets were scrunched and lifted, like a figure was under them. I silently got up and went to my mom's room and she was reluctant, but she let me sleep with her. When we went to check, the sheets were made and nobody was there. It took some bit of time to tell her the story 
Enough time that someone could have made the bed and run, I guess. I'm not sure if it was some deranged weirdo, or a mimic, or a copy, or what. But I'm so glad I noticed it. Because if it was the first one, I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't rolled over. This was a long time ago, when I was in the third or fourth grade. I used to live in a slightly haunted house in a small town. While I lived there, I would sometimes get the feeling that someone was following me around town, or in the house. Sometimes, I would also feel a couple of light taps on my shoulder, like someone was trying to get my attention. Other times, I would hear someone call my name from behind me. Every time I turned around to see who it was, there would be no one there. I could never see whatever was following me, but sometimes other people did. The first time it was my sister. She had finished washing the first load of dishes and was looking for me so that I could dry them and put them away. I was upstairs and I heard her yell my name. I yelled back and came downstairs. When I got there, she was staring at me like I had grown a second head. She told me that she came into the living room and saw me laying on the couch watching TV. She asked me if I was going to come in and finish the load of dishes. I didn't respond and kept staring at the TV. She yelled my name to get my attention. That's when she heard me yell back from upstairs. She looked up the stairs, then back to the couch to find that I had disappeared. Things like that happened a few more times around town with a few of my friends. They would see me somewhere, they would say hi, and they would get no response. Then I would show up shortly after, and the other me would vanish. I never got to see what it was that followed me before we moved. It never followed me out of town, or maybe it did and I never noticed, because the next house we moved into was haunted as heck. Either way, I thought it was an interesting experience. I barely remember this story, but my brother, who is four years older than me, remembers it vividly. My dad was on dialysis and went through eight-hour cycles. One night, my brother and I are in the computer room playing games at like 2 a.m. Suddenly, from around the corner, my dad appears. He starts being mischievous and trying to scare us. My dad was never a jokester. Plus, he was supposed to be on his dialysis machine. My brother was so unnerved, he said, Dad, what are you doing off your machine? My dad replied, Oh, it's fine. The facial expressions and manner of speaking prompted my brother right then and there to ask, Are you a ghost? To which my dad replied, laughing, No, of course not. Then started heading up the dark stairs. My brother watched as my dad climbed the stairs and decided to follow him. When he reached the bedroom door that my dad turned into, he saw my real father was in there fast asleep and was already hooked up to his dialysis machine, which was running properly. Not only was my father never one to kid around, he was also very sick at this time with kidney failure and cancer. To scare us in the computer room, he would have had to go out of his way to literally come from the dark shadows of the dining room which meant going down the stairs and looping around. My brother knew something was up right away, and he won't ever forget this story. My boyfriend of two years and I go to the same college, 
We both take night classes and live in an apartment complex across the street from campus. Neither of us are paranormal enthusiasts, no Ouija boards, etc. And we're also agnostic. So class is from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. We walk over together, but usually I walk back on my own unless I run into him coming back from the lecture building. This time I was walking alone. It's about a 10 minute walk to the apartment. I could see the light was on as I approached the building and I thought he had gotten home first. I thought that was a little strange since I hadn't seen him walking in front of me, but I figured his class had let out early. For some reason, I stopped to look in the window before I went in. I could see what looked like him sitting on the couch, but something was weird. He was sitting very stiffly with his shoulders kind of lifted and staring out the window. He, or it, must have seen me because he gave me a very hateful scowl, got up and walked to the back room, down the hallway and out of sight. When he stood up, he kind of swayed like he was drunk. This was bad because my boyfriend is two years sober. Also, he has never scowled at me like that for no reason. I went inside, calling out to him, but I got no response. I went to the back room, and nobody was there. I searched that whole apartment, which didn't take long because there's only two bedrooms, and only so many places a grown man could hide. The only way that this thing could have gotten out other than the door would be to take the screen out of one of the back windows and climb out. But we had to replace one of the screens last year, and it was difficult to remove and put back in. You needed to remove four screws. It was an old building. It would have only had seconds to do this entire process. My boyfriend got back at around 10.30, and I told him what happened. He's a lot closer to an atheist than I am, and managed to convince me in the moment that it wasn't real. But I'm not so sure, really. Nothing else has been weird since, and this happened a week ago. But it keeps bothering me. I don't even know how to explain this, except for that it has to be something paranormal. I'm super freaked out. Last night at exactly 3.38 AM, I woke up with the quietest scream I've ever produced. I didn't even think I was capable of screaming so quietly. As soon as I opened my eyes, I saw this almost ball of black static floating over my husband. And as soon as he woke up from me screaming, it dissipated. He asked me what was wrong and I couldn't even get the words out. All I muttered was flies because it sounded like a huge swarm above him. He rolled over and went back to sleep. When I woke up this morning, I remembered what I saw and it definitely wasn't flies. I usually have very lucid dreams and I'm able to identify pretty well what's a dream and what's reality. I'm also really good at remembering my dreams. But last night, I don't remember anything except this ball of black static floating over my husband. It really freaks me out. I've never seen or heard of anything like this. If anyone has an explanation or can tell me what this entity was, I would really appreciate it. I don't feel anything sinister in my home, but this was just too scary. Edit. My husband woke up this morning feeling refreshed. He's been sleeping pretty poorly all week, but he doesn't remember anything about last night. He vaguely remembers me gasping, as he put it, but nothing visual. Final edit. I feel like I should add that my husband has been sleeping badly all week from what we assume is withdrawal effects from nicotine. Also, a lot of people saying what I saw could be the salt and pepper pattern on the TV on the ceiling are wrong. It was that salt and pepper static, but this was very clearly a three-dimensional round ball or orb shape, about two to three feet in diameter. 
I couldn't see the ceiling through it. Again, if anyone knows what this is, let me know. So, my girlfriend has been experiencing issues with a dark entity for about seven years, since she moved out of an old house a number of years back. This entity started showing up in the house, in a room where she said she felt very ill just being near it. This entity looks exactly like her, to the point that when she cuts her hair, it has her new hair. She's shrouded in all black and it seems that she has facial features, but you can't make them out. She only seems to show up when my girlfriend is doing bad mentally and seems to feed off of the negative emotions. She has been described to somewhat sound like my girlfriend, even to other people who have seen her. Along with her, there have been other spirits documented by other members of the house, with a local ghost crew coming over every once in a while. The hot spot is the closet in her mom's upstairs bedroom, where they're most sighted. Any thoughts on what type of spirit this could be? Other than filling people with a feeling of dread, this entity hasn't harmed anyone, but any help would be appreciated. So I would like to share something that happened to me when I was about 9 or 10 years old. I'm 26 now. So to set the context, I was back in England living with my family in an old Victorian house with my sisters and mom. Just us girls. I loved the house. I never felt spooked or whatever in it at all. One night I was in bed ready to sleep. And all of a sudden my bed cover went perfectly neat and flat like no bumps, creases, anything. And then loads of symbols started to appear, fast. I can recall vaguely what they were, but it's really hard to explain. When I try to rethink it though, I get all uncomfortable and kind of feel sick if I concentrate on what I saw too much. Then it all stopped suddenly, and I felt a weight at my feet, as if somebody was sitting down on my bed with me. So, I was petrified, not moving, like as if I were stuck, not able to shout. I then found myself surrounded by a bright light, and I had all these people leaning over me. The way I explain it is, you know when you're getting ready for an operation, and you're in the operating room and everyone is just waiting for you to fall asleep to actually start the surgery, and they're all just looking down at you? Exactly that. Well, this was too much for me. I leaped out of my bed and jumped down the stairs four by four, ran from the house screaming that they were going to get me, but my mom grabbed me before I got to the road and I can't remember what happened after that. I was talking about this with her yesterday and she told me that this actually went on for two to three nights before I stopped. I know that as a read it doesn't sound very scary, but it was a horrible experience. Has anyone ever experienced something like this? Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, 
We got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dads and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart, but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did, simply because I didn't know what it was and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are, or were, and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker, or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids, such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon, and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk, while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep, so I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me, and I looked away for a second, but when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse, with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. 
It was about two feet lower down than I was, right outside my window, eye level with me. The window is about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me, badly. Number two. My best friend C and my other best friend at the time K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves, so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it, not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching, with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed. They were formed, like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. Back about 10 or so years ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer that they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property. We didn't think much of anything until about 20 minutes later, when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder and we caught quite a few strange things on that. One day before heading out there, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40 minute drive from the property. So we thought, hey, why don't we go and try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, but after a bit of driving around, we pulled up into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. 
We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the massive amount of bugs swarming around us. Only a few short seconds later, we heard huge dogs barking, growling, and then saw them running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the general area for a little while longer, just exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we start hearing barking. It was rather startling, and she immediately froze and said that she had never heard barking in the area before. She isn't one to get scared easily, so her uneasiness put me on edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around, throwing rocks, but it didn't seem to do any good. I had never known coyotes to act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they would get any closer, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand and we booked it into the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt a sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We neared the car, and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side of the car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we needed to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skinwalker, but neither of us have ever been able to explain it, and I have never been back. My mom, my mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some stories a while back which happened to her her brothers and others in their area. And I feel that some of them are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about. And I've talked about a few of them on Reddit. But for now, I want to tell you another one of my mom's stories. One of the stories my mom told me was something that had happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby them. There was a family driving through the forests and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s before cell phones were widespread. So they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them as if something was following them through the woods or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house and they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it. Whatever was following them let out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted my grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house, wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field, though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend, and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry, and when it saw my uncle Mike and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence, and ran off. Apparently, it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected, but this would have been many, many years ago, and my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident, so I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to these things, black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. 
all would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story, and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace, and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would have been mistaken identity or not. What does interest me, though, are the stories of the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, and the Wisconsin-Michigan Dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know, and I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in the world, be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. I've had a long history of paranormal things happening to me, but these take the cake. I lived in the middle of Hicktown swamps in Georgia when these took place. When I was 13, I ran away from home for personal reasons. I booked it to a local nature trail in the middle of a wildlife reserve. I ran down it about 15 minutes, and a hand reached out from the bush to my right and hit me in the chest. I got back up and looked for my attacker, but there was nothing there. I proceeded to run home, crying like a real man. When I was 15, I was laying in bed, scrolling through creepypasta articles, when I hear a sort of rhythmic tapping on my window. I freak out and pretend I can't hear it for a while, until I can't stand it anymore. I pull the curtain back. It's only a raccoon. I hit the window and scare him off and try to calm myself down. About a half an hour later, the same tapping, the same rhythmic pattern. Kind of like click, click, scratch, click, click, scratch. So I decide I'm going to get my BB gun and take it out on the raccoon, scare him, you know, so he won't come back. So I grab my BB gun, I open the window, I take aim. And there's this shadowy figure that resembles a man staring right at me, right on the border of my lawn that connects my yard to the huge expanse of woods around my house. And it just stares at me and slowly walks into the woods behind it. After that, I didn't sleep for about a week. In fall of last year, on a walk down the nature trail with two of my friends, Antoine and Justin, we were just cracking jokes and drinking. It was 4 a.m., and we were just having a great time. On the walk back home, I feel this awful presence. I look behind me, and I see something at the end of the trail, in the distance. My vision isn't the best, but from what I could tell, it looked like a man with a deer head as his own. So I looked away. I told my friends not to say a word until we got home. Justin knew of my past occurrences, and he doesn't really mess around with paranormal stuff, so he listened and just kept walking. But Antoine just looked at me for like 15 minutes while walking perfectly straight. I freaked out and started doing the strangest movements of my arms to see if he would mimic them, and every time he would. At one point, I locked both my arms and put them on my head, and he did the exact same thing. I was ready to just leave him in the woods that night, honestly. Eventually, he screamed something completely unintelligible, and it scared the crap out of me, so I threw a punch at him and he dodged it. I apologized, told him to shut up, and then told them all to run home with me. When we got there, we discussed what we had seen and what happened, and Antoine said that he completely blacked out as soon as we started walking the nature trail, only to wake up to me throwing a punch at him. About two months ago, another thing happened, and this was where I drew the line. I've moved since this incident, and I honestly don't plan on ever going back. I was walking down the nature trail again. Clearly, I hadn't learned my lesson. I was listening to music, having a good time, and this thick, permeable smell of blood hit my nose. I genuinely thought I had a nosebleed for a second until, through my headphones, I hear somebody talking. 
I take off one of my headphones and have a look around. Nothing. Speed walking out of there, it happens again. And this time, it sounds exactly like a man screaming, Warbringer. Instantly, I'm on the verge of tears. I jerk back and look around as fast as possible. And I see it. There's a fully naked man, resembling more of a corpse than a man, with a bleeding, rotting horse's head. His arm was extended out toward me. I ran home and packed my things. Now by this point, I have so many theories as to what happened, but I hate indulging them. They all scare the hell out of me. My current idea is that I'm just nuts. I'm not sure, but whatever the case is, if there's anyone here who can explain what I saw, I'm very open to it. I've told a story before about living in a flat where this thing that I called the Whistler always came by. I had other experiences in this flat too, and this one thing has to be the worst by far. It's hard to describe the sense of dread and fear that this thing gave off. It honestly felt like my life was at risk, and my whole body would scream to run. Anytime I would hear this thing, I was alone, which, of course, just made it all worse. One night, the dog was barking outside, so I got up and went out to look. As I was looking outside, the dog went back in and left me alone, standing in the dark next to the shed. I soon became aware of noises in the shed, but put it down to the wind. That is, until I moved closer, and I felt a strong sense of dread. I listened to the sound sounds like a person on all fours scuffling around. I heard it move toward the shed door, so I ran inside and slammed the door. I sat down and tried to tell myself that it was still just the wind. At first, the dread was going away, but then I could feel it building up again. It felt like it was trying to find a way in, moving back and forth along the walls of the house. Then, I suddenly felt it inside the apartment. It had gotten into the kitchen. I'm not quite sure how. The window, maybe. I could feel it getting slowly closer. I was too scared to look behind me into the kitchen, but I managed to jump up and slam the door. I hoped it would leave, and it did. After this, I would hear it sometimes, just scuffling around at night. The alley at the back was dark and smelly so I assumed it liked it. Now this next bit is truly a fault on my own part. I really should have listened to my own gut feeling. It was months later. It was summer and therefore very warm, so I had the back door open. I was on my laptop and it had gotten dark. At some point, I turned the light on and sat back down. I sat facing the back door. My laptop screen stopped me from seeing the bottom half of the door. After a while, I started to hear movement outside and felt uneasy. But I told myself that it was nothing. Yep, I just sat there and told myself I was being stupid. But the feeling grew stronger and stronger. My whole body screaming at me to run. Then, our dog comes running downstairs stops in the middle of the room, looks at me, and then goes to walk outside. The way she did this was just... odd. I pulled down my screen and watched her head toward the back door. As she walked out the back door, there was this... thing. Some humanoid figure crouched down by the door. Its skin was dark brown, like dirt and rot, and had texture like it had been burned. It was hairless and skinny, like it hadn't eaten in months. There it was, this thing I had been in fear of for so long, right up against the door frame, trying to make its way inside. The figure twisted its emaciated form round to follow our dog. It was crouched down onto its hands and feet. That's why it was making the scuffling noise. 
I jumped up and threw my laptop to the floor. I ran upstairs and refused to go back down alone. The stupidest thing was that I doubted myself, and if it wasn't for the dog, then I don't know what would have happened. Her look toward me when she came downstairs. I can only imagine she was wondering why I wasn't running away. A friend told me it sounded like a skinwalker, and that Europe does have accounts of such things, but I don't know. I don't know what that thing was, but either way, I'm so happy that we moved. I actually overheard this on the news a few years back, about a cryptid in Kentucky. It's a feline-like creature, said to look like a mountain lion mixed with some sort of monstrosity. I didn't really think much about it until my friend, we'll call him Bran, told me what he saw when he was deer hunting. It was pretty late and he and his dad were about to pack up. They heard a low growl near them. His dad told him to get back up in the hunting perch. I'm not a hunter by any means, so don't crucify me for not knowing the correct lingo. Bran did and watched through his binoculars to watch for what had made the growl or for his dad to give him an all good. He watched for what he said might have been 10 to 15 minutes when movement caught his eye. He tried to get a better look when he saw the weird creature that I mentioned earlier. It scared him so badly that he froze. He thought it was just a mountain lion or a bobcat, but it had four eyes. His dad managed to distract it off by startling a nearby doe. It left, chasing its newfound prey. He and his dad waited until they couldn't hear it and then booked it back to their truck. He was pretty shaken up the whole week after. I felt bad for him. However, this wasn't his only run-in with a cryptid or a strange creature. Despite being underage, he still does a lot of dangerous or stupid things, such as drinking and driving, smoking cigarettes, and other really dumb things. He's not shy about it either. Well, he'd been doing that first one, but wasn't totally drunk yet, and his best friend, we'll call him Dave, was taking a joy ride with him on some back roads, which aren't hard to find in our region. They were messing around, having a good time, blaring music, you know, teenager things. He was focusing on the road, listening to a story Dave was telling him, when he saw a strange, pale, humanoid, quadrupedal, fleshy creature with visible teeth and large black eyes run out onto the road. Bran hit his brakes and just barely missed it. It screeched at him and ran off into the woods on the other side of the road. Bran and Dave sat there trying to process what had happened and if what they both saw was real. They stopped drinking and went straight back to Dave's house, where they proceeded to freak out. They told me this story too as I sat next to them in a couple of classes. Well, I asked them to describe the creature to me, as I'm known for researching and collecting information on cryptids, urban legends, and monsters, and they felt I could help. After they gave me the description, I came up with a list of possible creatures and showed them art and, quote, real pictures of them on Bran's phone. Once we got to Wendigos, Skinwalkers, and the Rake, they showed clear signs of distress. I pulled up one of the well-known Rake pictures and showed it to them. I thought Bran was going to have a heart attack. He yelled, that's it. It has to be. It's almost dead on. Dave scrolled through the related pictures and found a different photo and quietly showed both of us. Bran then fell silent. They both said that that was it. That was the creature they nearly hit. I told them that they had to be bullshitting me because the rake is a creepypasta. I told them the story and what it's known for and that they were not proven to be real and were in fact very likely fake. But they insisted that that's what they saw. They thanked me and asked me if there was a way to protect themselves if it came for them. I told them I didn't know, but fire was probably the best route if it actually was real. They haven't had any experiences since that I know of, but it did freak them and me out a good amount. I was glad I could help them, but now I'm terrified of the woods, more than I previously was. 
and I question more and more if these legends are just legends. I already believed in a few, but it's just terrifying to think that more of them could be real. It was the summer of 2010, and I was still in high school. My friend's dad invited me with his family to go camping near a lake that was a Native American reservation at one point. We get to the campsite, and my friend and I start experiencing weird things. We got chased by a swarm of ghost bees, and we just started to feel like it wasn't safe to be by ourselves. There was a shaman who was going to tell stories around his campsite, and he was inviting campers to come by that night and listen. When night came, I had to walk a ways to the public restroom at the campsite. I get to the restroom, and a guy comes running out, screaming that there are hornets in the bathroom. I was scared of stinging bugs, so I decided to go in a bush that was about four yards away from the restroom. I start peeing and I start hearing rustling coming from the bush. I shine the flashlight and he has darkish skin with white face paint and he's almost half naked. I jumped back and I screamed and I scraped my elbow. A nearby camper ran over to help me and I told him that I saw a man crouched in the bushes. This dad-like figure shines his flashlight into the bush and dives into the bush now, all this happened in a matter of minutes. From me seeing the guy and screaming and the other guy coming to help me. I probably only looked away for a second, but when the guy jumped into the bush, he stands back up and he's holding a rabbit. The guy also found burning sage. He told me what sage was because I didn't even know what it was at the time. He put the rabbit down and told me it was just my imagination or that if I was being truthful, the guy ran away, and I shouldn't go alone to the bathroom anymore. I go back to my campsite, and my friend's dad asked me what took so long. I didn't tell him what happened. He then tells us that he wants all of us to go to the shaman's camp so we can hear the stories. So we go to the campsite, and this guy was dressed to the nines. Headdress, necklace, feathers, white face paint, and no, he was not the guy in the bushes. The shaman was probably in his 40s, and he said that his father taught him everything he knows. He told us the history of the lake, and that it was his people's land, and that we took it from them. Literally being honest as can be, and not sugarcoating it for the kids. We killed them and turned their home into a lake, and that his ancestors' bones are in that lake. He then starts telling us about native legends, and he starts talking about skinwalking. He told us that some people in these tribes were so in tune with nature that they could take on the form of other animals, mainly coyotes or dogs, but they can shift into other animals too. I was starting to feel genuinely spooked, and after his whole get together ended, I told him about what I saw in the bush. He grabbed me by the shoulder and took me to his trailer and told me to wait outside. He came out with a single red feather and looked at my elbow and told me that I was wounded in battle and that this feather will show the skinwalkers that they should respect me and they will leave me alone. I didn't know what to do, so I took the feather and as I walk away, he shouts, they don't show themselves to everyone. I slept pretty good that night and the rest of the time we stayed after I got that feather. But like the dumbass kid that I was, I didn't treat it with respect, and I lost the feather not soon after I got back home. I wish I still had it. I'm not saying that skinwalkers exist, but the shaman seemed to take what I said really seriously, and I wanted to share my experience. It was around 10 o'clock at night, off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. 
It was mother, her boyfriend, my sister, and I. We were driving home from our vacation, and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night, and it was the scenic route. We were driving down, and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was on my phone, texting, and listening to music. We eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to. It was boring, but I occasionally looked up every now and then as I'd had the entire ride. It was a straight path forward with nothing but street lights. So we were driving and driving, and as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half-sleep trance. Then I suddenly woke up, and everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there were no muffled conversations. Everything seemed calm. But I had this sudden awareness. We were in the middle of the woods. It was dark and around 11.30 to midnight, and without the street lights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. I immediately felt a very paranoid vibe and turned my phone on and listened to music. Then we entered back on another street light stretch and we drove on. The strange part is, it's almost like something told me to go on my phone, as if there was a notification, but I checked and nothing was there. When I did this though, I noticed something in my peripheral. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off in an area where the road kind of turns. This was a fairly wooded area and you couldn't see much without light, so we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out from the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving out. It was limping, but when it was fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone chilling. A naked, ash white, skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped, and as I saw it, it turned its head toward us. Its eyes were a deep charcoal black. We sped up fast and started driving. It was not human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car weightlessly, defying physics. My mom's Mercedes had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I got a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scary part was, when it jumped over our car, the sunroof was open. I'm glad we got out of there. As a kid, maybe 11 years old, I was once in the forest looking for lost things. Then I came across a small pond, really a small pool in the forest. A woman was standing in the water. The water reached her knees. She was looking to the other direction and I couldn't see her face. She had white hair and some old looking clothes. They looked extremely old fashioned. She didn't turn to me and she didn't move at all, but I could see her breathing. I came closer and then she left the water and stood on the forest ground. As she was raising her feet from the water, I saw that her feet were backwards. I was shocked, frozen, but I freaked out and finally turned around and began to run. As I was running, I looked back and I could see her face. She was looking at me with this evil grin and an extremely pale face. I went home and told the story to my parents and of course they did not believe me. I've never forgotten this encounter and I was wondering if anybody else had any accounts of people having backwards feet. I went to this forest multiple times afterwards with my friends, never alone again, but I couldn't even find the pond, let alone the woman anymore. The closest thing I've found on the internet is the saguapa, 
As soon as I saw a picture of one, it gave me chills. The woman I saw looked exactly the same, but she was extremely pale. Everything else looks the same though. I'm fairly certain that this is what I saw, but I'm also open to any other ideas. Last night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. I heard this soft yelling and was confused at first as to why somebody was out. Then, as I listened more, I realized there was a pattern to it. I wanted to get up to the window and see who was making that sound, thinking that they may just be a drunk person walking around the parking lot. But there was this overwhelming sense of dread that came over me, like, if I looked outside, I would be drawn to go outside, and if I went outside, I would never come back. This rhythmic whooping continued on for easily 20 minutes, and then stopped altogether. It was not an animal, I know this for sure. I have had paranormal experiences before, so maybe I'm easily spooked but I think I was being lured outside. And even though it sounded human, I didn't get up to look. Now it's the morning after and I can't shake this feeling. Does this sound familiar to anyone else? Some kind of hunting practice for a known humanoid or cryptid? As a note, I live in an area of owls and wild birds and I hear them consistently throughout the week. I know what they sound like. I don't have coyotes or any big cats in my area. I listen to owls outside my window often, and I can tell you that this was something different. I don't know how to explain it, but it almost sounded like a human trying to imitate an owl. I only immediately dismissed it as being a wild animal because it was so unlike anything I've ever heard. I would love to know what it could be. This is a story from when I was growing up in Northern Kentucky in the 90s. I would have been right around 10, maybe a little older. I'm in my 30s now, but I vividly remember this happening and I still think about it all the time. My best friend lived with his grandparents for a bit on several acres of land in Walton, Kentucky, and I spent almost every weekend there. They never really did much with the land. It remained relatively cleared, but there were no farms or structures on it. They had a horse stable near the house, but that was it. My friend had received a go-kart for his birthday, so we were out driving it around on the open land. It was just the two of us, and we were having a blast riding this thing around. It was getting close to dusk, and we knew we were going to have to pack it in pretty soon. We came to a stop, and the engine cut out, and almost at the same time, both of us had this really strange feeling come over us. We felt like we were being watched by something. It's weird how our lizard brains can still even process something like this, but we both agreed that there was just this weird, overbearing feeling. We hadn't heard his grandpa's truck, and we were too far out to be seen from the house, so we started looking around. We were in an open field in the middle of their land, and it was surrounded by trees and tall brush. But something caught my eye first, and I got my friend to look in that same direction. In the brush, we could see a long, almost black shape sitting very still. I know at this point in the story, most of you are thinking Bigfoot. I can say I remember things being dead silent. Even now, I sometimes wonder if it was something else we saw. But all I remember is thinking that it was a giant black wolf. I would guess it was maybe 200 feet away from us and it was sitting perfectly still. But to me anyway, it looked furry. I couldn't make out any other features like ears or eyes. But I swear, this was what was making us feel watched. It's like when you see a cat getting ready to pounce. That's what it felt like when we were looking at this thing. 
We were both getting really spooked at this point. The sun was getting down low behind the tree line, and one of us was going to have to jump out and pull start the engine back up. We were whispering about what it was that was watching us. Honestly, I forget which one of us jumped out and started the cart back up, but when we looked back at where the black shape had been, it was gone. The go-kart didn't have any lights, so we drove as fast as we could back to his grandparents' house and we told them what we saw. His grandpa said we probably just saw a coyote or maybe a boar, but this shape was long and low and, I don't know, coyote and boar, they just don't sit well in my head with what I saw. Not to mention it was pitch black and very furry. Every few years I think about this story and I've read that there are no wolves in Kentucky anymore. I think I've just convinced myself it was a coyote or something, but the memory has stuck in my head all this time. Nothing else ever happened on his grandparents' land aside from a really bad car accident a few years later and some missing chickens, but again, a coyote would explain that. And every once in a while, the horses would get really riled up at night. We would go camping on the land and fishing a lot, and we had a lot of fun around there. Anyway, this is my short little spooky story. I wish it had more bite to it, but it's 100% what happened. What do you think we saw? In 2001, a couple of days after my mother gave birth to my brother, she brought him home from maternity. I was seven at the time. My brother's cot was in my parents' bedroom, right next to their bed. That first night of my newborn brother being home, my dad was working a night shift, so I went to sleep next to my mother, as I usually did when my dad would be working nights. Around two or three in the morning, my mom and I both wake up at the same time and look at each other, confused as to why we woke up, realizing that my brother was still fast asleep, or at least wasn't crying or making a noise. We listened for any other noise that might have woken us up, but nothing. Not a minute later, this whooshing loud noise fills the room and we feel a strong breeze or wind. Then we hear the whooshing sound again, this time closer to my baby brother's cot. My mom jumps out of bed, freaking out that somehow the window was left open and a bird got in. Now that whooshing sound was exactly like wings flapping, but it was more like massive wings were flapping, not a regular bird. And the gust of wind it created was also massive. Lights go on, my brother is awake now, but was not scared by the noise or the wind. He was just kind of looking around. My mom starts looking for birds when I point out that the window is in fact closed. She still makes me get up and have a look around with her for anything that could explain it. We had a chat afterwards about it and she told me that as soon as she got over the shock, she heard a voice telling her, it's okay just as she was about to check up on my brother. In the moment, she assumed I was trying to calm her down. But when I denied it, she realized that the voice didn't sound like me at all. I also heard the it's okay, and it sounded genuinely reassuring. It's worth adding that we heard and felt the winged thing come, but we never heard or felt it leave. We stayed up the rest of the night, waiting for something else to happen, but it never did. While the noise and all scared us initially, we both felt relaxed, relieved, content, and happy all at the same time. It's hard to describe the feeling. Mind you, the whole thing happened in like 10 seconds, but that weird feeling stayed with us the rest of the day. When my dad came home and was told the story, he was genuinely worried, and my mom just told him that it's okay. He has nothing to worry about. At his puzzled look that my mom hadn't joined him in being worried, she just said, trust me, I have a good feeling about this. Now, I don't know why she said it like that, but at the same time, I completely understood it. 
It's been a long time since this happened, but it's still very clear in both mine and my mom's memories. I have tried to look this up through the years, but came up empty. I would love to get an idea of what it was. So here's my story. I always thought that I believed in these kinds of things, but now that it's happened to me, I'm trying my hardest to rationalize it away. Unfortunately, I can't. I just want to start off by saying that I am 37 years old, and I have never experienced anything like this in my life, and I hope never to experience it again. This happened three days ago. It was 11.30 at night, and I was taking my dog out to go to the bathroom. My boyfriend and I live on about four acres of land. We have an overgrown field in the distance. It's somewhere near the house, but not super close. I was carrying one of those spotlight flashlights. It's so powerful that you can see the beam shoot through the night sky. My dog and I were getting close to the field, so I decided to scan it with a flashlight. What I saw next still terrifies me. I saw this creature walking through the field. It had a human-shaped head, but the eyes were nothing like I had ever seen. They were so big that it took up a majority of its face. They glowed in a way that I have never seen. It was a piercing glow. I know that flashlights can create a certain type of reflective glow, but this was different. It was almost like the light was shooting out of its eyes. I live in a wooded area, so I have come into contact with many animals at night. This was not a set of eyes like I've ever seen on any animal here. It's weird because I don't recall seeing a mouth, but that could have been because I was so fixated on its abnormally large eyes that I wasn't paying attention to its lower face. Its eyes had this shocked, but evil look to them. That expression really stood out to me because it was so eerie. Now let's get to the body. It was somewhat human shape, but it had abnormally long extremities. Even though the overgrown field covered some of its body, I could still tell the shape of it. The arms were too long for its body. I checked out how tall the overgrown grass was the next day and based on that, I estimated that the creature was about six feet tall. The way it walked terrified me. It was facing me and walking sideways while staring at me. I have to admit that I got so scared I lowered the flashlight to the ground, but then I got the nerve to raise it back up after a few seconds. It had made its way down the field a little more, but it was still walking sideways and staring at me with those horrifying eyes. Needless to say, I took my dog inside after that and had a mini freak out. I've done a lot of research online and I cannot figure out what that thing was. I just know that it wasn't an animal or a human and I hope that I never see it again. I haven't really spoken to anyone about this other than my boyfriend and his brother. His brother gave off the impression that he thought I was crazy and laughed it off, so I've not said anything to anyone since. It's been driving me crazy ever since I saw it. This happened in March of 2021. Where I live in England, there's a lot of countryside. At the time it happened, I was driving down a small country road that was parallel to a main road. Just a large field and bush on the other side next to the main road to separate them. I was talking to my boyfriend, and I noticed this very tall human-like figure at the side of the road. It was extremely skinny, like it was skin and bones and nothing else. It didn't appear to have any clothes on, it had pale skin, and it looked really unhealthy. I didn't really see its face, but from the quick glance I got, it looked like it had indistinguishable facial features 
like it had been blurred in Photoshop or something. It crossed the road onto the field in front of me extremely quickly, and then disappeared into an open field. I slowed right down and looked back into the field. It was mid-evening, so it was getting dark, but you could still see. There was nothing it could have hid behind. The grass was too short to hide in, and there was no way that any human could have ran the entire length of that field to the bush on the other side in such a short amount of time. Whatever it was, just vanished into thin air. My boyfriend told me to stop the car, but I was terrified and everything in me told me to continue driving, so I never stopped to check it out. I'm not sure whether that was a mistake or not. I don't know why it's terrified me so much, but I can't stop thinking about it and it's driving me crazy. I'm searching for an explanation. I know it may be unlikely, but has anyone else ever seen something like this? If so, do you have any idea what it was? My only explanation is something paranormal. If it were human, how did it just vanish like that? I would love to know. For some background, I live in the California foothills. My parents and I moved into this house from the city in late 2017, after it had been sitting empty for over a year. The day we moved in, my mother and I arrived first to clean, while my father and brother drove the moving truck. Right off the bat, I was uneasy, but I tried to write it off. The property felt heavy, is the only way I can describe it. Some people on here describe the feeling of being watched inside their homes, but I had that feeling any time I stepped outside. We were going to sweep and mop the floors, dust the baseboards and window sills, when I started noticing this white granular powder all along the baseboards and the window sills and the doorways. I immediately told my mother, who told me not to worry about it and just sweep it up. By the time I had swept up every room and cleaned off the window sills, I was certain that it was salt, and a lot of it. But fine, whatever. The people that lived here before were superstitious. All right, I can live with that. We unpacked the truck over the next week. I was setting up my room when the next bizarre events started happening. Knocking on the windows. Always quick raps that sounded like someone knocking with their knuckles. It would happen so often, on all the windows in the house, but when you would turn, no one would be there. You'd go outside, and no one would be around the house. This only escalated. My brother would stay up late in his room on his computer every night. He liked to game with his friends until early in the morning. He does not spook easily, but on more than one occasion I would wake up to him shaking me awake, terrified saying something massive on two legs was walking around outside his bedroom window, which he would have open at night. He said it would walk right up to his bedroom window and stop, and when he would look toward the sound, he could hear it scrambling away. I never saw it with my own eyes, and neither did he, but the motion lights outside would be activated every single time, leading to the woods near the back of our property. I know what you're probably thinking. All of this up to this point can be explained away rationally. A crazy person living in the woods, some neighbor messing with us for whatever reason. Well, that was what I told myself too, so I could sleep a little easier at night. And then the banging started. It was so loud, and it would sound like it was coming from everywhere at once. The walls would literally vibrate, picture frames rattling right off the walls. It was like something massive, stronger than any crazy person, was pounding on the exterior walls of the house, always late at night, and always in more places than just one. I could never pinpoint the source directly. My brother and I would stumble out of our bedrooms petrified, and my mom would lead us to her room where we would stay after that. My dad would walk the perimeter of our property with his gun, but he never found anything. No footprints, no people, nothing. 
This happened for probably six months, and every time a major event would happen, my dad would walk the perimeters with his rifle and come back with nothing. We felt like we were going insane. And then, suddenly, it just stopped. The mutilated animals stopped appearing. I stopped feeling like I was being watched any time I would go outside. My dogs stopped being so on edge any time I took them out. And the property itself seemed to get lighter, like it finally took a deep breath after holding it for so long. I genuinely have no explanation, or even a clue as to what that creature, being, or entity even was. I'm just glad it seems to have moved on. Hopefully it didn't stop, because it moved in. So, back in 07, I was eight years old. My grandparents and I lived up on a mountain in northern Georgia, in Floyd County, and our property was against the Bartow County line. It's a warm September night, just a couple of days after my birthday. I'm up in my room playing Call of Duty on my Wii, and my grandpa walks in and asks if I can take the trash out before it gets too cold. I say sure, and pause my game and slip my shoes on. I walk out into the garage and open the garage door to throw the bag into my grandpa's truck. I turn on the light on the outside of the garage and walk to my grandpa's truck. Me being eight years old at the time, I was afraid of the dark, so I kind of sped walked and threw the bag in and hoped to make it. However, I did not make it, and I heard the bag land on the ground behind the truck. My head drops and my heart starts to pound for some reason. Like I know that if I go behind the truck, something will get me. You know, the basic eight-year-old paranoia. So I run to the back of the truck, pick up the bag and toss it in, and turn around to go back into the garage when I see something. The way my driveway is, it turns off a gravel road, then curves to the left and up a hill. The hill smooths out a little bit, but doesn't level off completely. Right where the hill gets less steep, I see a dark figure, just standing there. In the light coming from the garage, I can just make out its silhouette. It appears to be a person at first, but then my eyes adjust, and I can vaguely make out hair covering its entire body. I stand there frozen with fear, like if I turn my back it's going to sprint up and get me. So I hesitantly walk backwards toward the garage while keeping my eyes fixed on it. And it seemed that every step I took, it took one also. I finally reached the hole where the garage door is placed and ran as fast as I could inside. When I got inside, I ran into the living room for my grandpa. And I say, Grandpa, get the gun. There's something in the driveway. It's big and it's walking on two feet. I don't know what it is, but it scares me. So my grandpa got the gun and we go outside on the front porch, which is a good 40 yards closer to the part of the hill that I saw it on. And it's not there. My grandpa says, you sure you saw something? I don't say anything, I just nod. He drops the gun from the shoulder and says, come on, you haven't put the new trash bag in the can yet. We both turn around and walk back inside. Several hours go by and nothing else happens, until about 1 a.m. I wake up from having a nightmare of what I saw. I lay in my bed and look at my curtained windows, and I can see that the front porch light is on. I find that safer because it acts as a sort of nightlight for me. So I'm laying there looking at my window when I see a huge shadow walk right in front of my window on the outside, and I mean huge. The window sat about two feet off the ground, was about four feet tall, and was about two and a half feet from the ceiling. And this shadow was tall enough to cast a shadow big enough to where it looked like someone was sliding a wall past the window. I could hear the boards creaking out on the front porch, and could see how wide this thing was from a side view. This thing, whatever it was, was at least two feet wide from the side and it was absolutely 
huge. I didn't want to go get my grandparents because I didn't want them to get mad for waking them if there was nothing there. So I just watched this thing walk back and forth past my window, and before too long, somehow I fell asleep. Fast forward to the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. I had moved off the mountain, but was still going to the same school. Anyway, like a week before school got out, my best friend Kevin and I thought that it might be a good idea to go up to the mountain and to see if we could find this thing. Maybe it was still there. Without hesitation, I jumped at the opportunity. So the following weekend, after school ended, I met up with him and we brought some camping gear, along with some food, and a 30-odd six. I tell him we can camp out at the house that I saw this thing at, and he agreed that that was the best place to start. So we make it to the night and he's like, let's get out and walk around. I say, okay. So we both get out of the tent. I instantly felt like I was being watched. I shouldered the rifle and I felt the adrenaline filling my veins. Kevin put his hand on the barrel and lowers the end of the gun to the ground. Don't do that, he said. You'll make me nervous. So we start walking around the woods. We find some small game paths and hear a few noises, but we don't really find anything. So we both look at each other and decide it's not worth it, so we start walking back to the tent. This walk will take us at least about 30 minutes. On our way back, we can hear things in the woods that sound like tree knocks and whoops. We get about 100 yards from the property that we're camping out on, and suddenly, a rock flies through the woods and lands within 10 feet of Kevin and I. Then, it's like it just unloaded on us. Rocks were landing all around us, with almost no time in between impacts. We hear all sort of whoops and hollers coming from different directions, almost like we were being surrounded, hunted. I tell Kevin to run, that I'd be right behind him. So we start running toward the property and hear the trees snapping behind us. I stop for a split second to raise the gun and fire a warning shot into the air. And then, all went silent. Kevin stops just in the clearing of the property and looks back at me. I looked back at him and we both run onto the property and book it out of there as fast as that pickup truck we drove would take us. I haven't been up there since and I don't intend to return. This past summer, my husband and I were invited down to a friend's cabin in Kentucky, not far from the Red River Gorge. We had so much fun during the week going hiking and riding around on the four-wheelers, things like that. Saturday was no different, and we had an awesome day out in the sun with a nice dinner planned out that evening around the fire. We were setting up outside, and I was joking around with our friend about me believing in Sasquatches and how they like to tree knock. He humored me and found a two-by-four for me to knock against the trees. I excitedly knocked on the trees for a good bit until I was satisfied but I didn't receive any knocks back. Soon, unfortunately, it started to rain, and I mean an absolute downpour that ended up knocking the power out. We got the generator running, lit some candles, and cracked some windows while dinner was cooking. Now, our friend had already told us that there were numerous Indian burial grounds on his property, and we were already in the midst of ghost stories. Dinner was soon done, and we were all eating around the table when I heard what sounded like someone talking right outside the back door. I immediately stopped eating and turned to the back door and asked our friend, what was that? He smiled at me and told me I knew exactly what that was from the stories he'd been telling us prior. I got up slowly from the table and headed to the back porch and sat down on the stool. I listened closely and the forest seemed to come alive. Amongst the whippoorwill calls, there were voices, drums, music, and soon after, there was whistling. Now mind you, his nearest neighbor was over a mile away, and they were an elderly couple, so there was no way that they would be making all this noise. 
My husband and our friend soon followed outside as well, and our friend recommends knocking on the trees again. I followed his direction and began knocking as loudly as I could. Still, there was no knock back, so I walked back up to the porch and sat on my husband's lap, listening to the music. The whistling continued, and we decided to humor it and to whistle back the exact same way that it had whistled. To our absolute nervous excitement, it began to whistle and pause, waiting for our response. We whistled back for a while, and our friend decided to hit the hay with his wife. Not long after he decided to go inside, the whistling came to a stop, as well as the drums, music, and even the birds had gone silent. It was the eeriest feeling I had ever had, and chills ran down my spine when far off in the distance, we heard a loud, single knock on a tree. I opened my mouth in disbelief when a dragging sound broke the silence again. The sound was something heavy, dragging what I thought were its feet through the leaves on the ground. It started off by the front gate where the knock had come from, and kept getting closer and closer, until it finally made its way to the gravel surrounding the cabin. My husband whispered under his breath, What is that? We shined our flashlight down the side of the cabin to see nothing. My husband pushed me out of his lap and, as a last chance to try to see what the sound was coming from, grabbed our friends to see if whatever this thing was would show up on thermal. We were frozen in fear, listening to this dragging noise approach where we were, and still we could see nothing. We were so scared we bolted inside. I've never seen my husband that terrified, and I've never been that terrified. Our commotion ended up waking up our friend, and he came out of his room to ask what was wrong. We told him what had happened after he went inside, and we told him that it was close to the side of the cabin. With the power still being out, we crept back to his room with the window still cracked, and we could easily still hear the dragging noise walking around the cabin. He built that cabin almost 20 years ago, and he had no words. He said he'd never heard that before and had no explanation. My husband had no words. I have never been so absolutely terrified, but yet excited in all my life. The next morning, I walked out onto the back porch, and the only thing that stood out to me was a single large footprint in the gravel. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet search on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through-hikers really looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. Though as time went on and the Forest Service had other more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled, except for dry river shelter number three, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling alongside the river. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. 
We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals. No disturbances on the trails or here at the shelter. The rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two by four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear had left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter, not open and on the floor. Hey, Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, man, I passed out, he said. It's not like there's anything to read in it anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great, now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night, he said. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he said, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the sight and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. 
Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional and saw the same thing independently? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? I'm first off, I'm currently 51 years old, and this still bothers me to this day. I have quite a few stories throughout my life to share, but this is the first. I was living in a new state, which I had never been to before. This was in the era where our parents told us to go out and play and be back at dinner time. I was nine years old in 1979, and we had just moved to Dallas, Texas. I was playing outside by myself, and I was approached by another young girl. She seemed normal and asked to play with me. I was okay with it. She asked if I wanted to see her playroom. I didn't see any reason not to, and I followed her. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse that looked like row houses, so we went into her townhouse, and I never saw anyone in the house, just the two of us. The townhouse looked normal enough, we went upstairs and into a bedroom that looked like a little girl's room. She walked up to the wall and pushed a panel, which opened. She crawled in and, stupid me, I followed. Inside was this amazing room full of toys and a little black kitten she was holding. I was so taken by all that was in front of me and I was just excited to play. We played for a bit. However, in the secret room, there were no windows or natural lighting. I couldn't tell what time it was. Eventually, I felt uncomfortable, like I needed to get home. So I told her I had to go. Mind you, never once asking for her name or telling her mine. But she turned to me with dark eyes and asked me by name if I really wanted to go because it was fun here in the room. I was creeped out because I know I didn't tell her my name. I crawled out and she followed me. I just kept moving down the stairs to the door, trying to avoid looking back. But once I opened the door, I did look back, and to me she looked like part girl and part skeleton. So I ran home, as it was dusk and I knew I was going to get in trouble. I didn't say anything about it to my mom. I went about my evening and slept like normal. But the next day, I was disturbed by it, and I decided to go back and see if she was still there. When I walked down to the townhome, it was boarded up like there'd been a fire there. I stood back and looked at it for a while, knowing that I had been in there yesterday, and it looked normal. I never saw or heard anything about that little girl again. I wish I had told someone who could have found out if she ever lived there. To this day, I can see that hidden playroom like it was yesterday, and I have no explanation. After my brother died, we didn't tell my children because I wasn't ready. One of my sons, three years old, pointed at his picture and said, Oh, Uncle Matt, he's my ghost friend that goes to the woods. A few weeks before this, he made me shut his door every single night because he didn't want his ghost friends to go to the woods to sleep. Super creepy but also creepily comforting. When my nephew was a toddler, about two years old, he would cry at night and say that there was a man in a hat in the closet who would talk to him. He was petrified, and he wouldn't even sleep in his bedroom anymore. He would only sleep in his sister's room every night. My brother lives in a home that was built by our grandfather. 
Our grandfather had cancer when we were teens. By the time it was found, it was really too late. Near the end of his life, we brought him back home and we turned the office room into a hospital room. That same room, many years later, had become my nephew's bedroom. My brother, sister-in-law, and I were all living at the house at the time, and we were all a bit startled. We didn't think it could actually be our grandfather, though. I mean, he wasn't the type of man to pop out of a closet in the dark and scare the shit out of a toddler. Whatever it was that my nephew saw, or thought he saw, has left him afraid of the dark and still prefers to sleep in the same room as his sister to this day. When my little niece was like four, we were in the car, and randomly, she goes, Mommy, are we puppets? My sister was like, no, no, baby, we're not puppets. My niece thought about it for a moment, and then said, I think we are, we just don't know it yet. Incredibly ominous, little child. Thanks. This one time, I was babysitting my cousin. She drew this really creepy picture of her friend Ellie. In this picture, Ellie had a braid wrapped around her neck and into her eyes, and she was pulling me into a closet. I asked her why she drew this, and she said, Ellie thinks you're mean. She told me she wants to hurt you, and she started crying. I mean, heck, I almost cried myself. Not much happened after that, but it was pretty terrifying. My mom said that when I was about nine or ten at night while I was sleeping, she would come into my room to turn my Christmas lights off. This was about late November or early December. And I apparently woke up immediately after she turned off the first set of lights and started screaming at her, what are you doing? Stop, really loudly. She turned the lights back on and I apparently went back to sleep. She asked me in the morning while I was getting ready for school if I remembered it happening and I didn't. I'm 14 now and still to this day, I don't remember that event happening. I'm sure that this startled the hell out of my mom, but it probably wasn't paranormal. Either way, she got a good scare. When I was younger, my brother and I were babysitting my goddaughter. We were all downstairs watching movies while lazing around on the couches when she starts to laugh hysterically and starts talking to what seemed like the stairs, repeating stuff like, that's funny. When I asked her what she was laughing at, she replied with, over there, can't you see him? The man with the green teeth sitting on the stairs. My brother and I grabbed her and got right out of there. I still don't like that basement. This occurred over 20 years ago, but it's still fresh on my mind. My son was born early. We were lucky, and he had a few issues, but we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. 
The cat refused to go into his room. And before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from this room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had just come into the room, only to turn and find out that I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say, peekaboo, when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine, and I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so little that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman. I would find this woman in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side next to the door. My husband slept on the left-hand side. I was asleep and I was woken up by being shaken roughly. I woke up and looked over at my husband and I said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and he was on the wrong side from where I was shaken from. I immediately jumped up and ran into my son's room. I flipped the light on, something I had never done up until this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you just need to startle them and they will begin again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and strange occurrences with the pets and toys continued, until my son came off of the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped. The pet stopped acting weird, and the Big Bird toy never went off on its own again. I believe that someone came home with him to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid-twenties, I'll always be grateful for her watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. I, ha I have a five-year-old boy. My son once asked me if I knew the man that died here. We were at home. I said, uh, no? He said, I do, and went on playing. A few weeks to a month later, he came up and hugged me and said, I waited a long time for you to be my mom. One time he told me that he couldn't sleep because of all the people calling his name. I don't remember the exact conversation, but it was in a questioning context, like he thought that maybe that happened to me too. I asked him if it was scary, and he said no. Scared me though. I called my sister and asked her to sage my house. This is a really short story, but it's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to me. My boss's kid came into my office and saw an old picture of my son. She said, oh, you have a little boy? I told her, yes, I do, but he isn't that little anymore. Before I could even finish my sentence, she said, because he's dead. 
I said, N no, he's alive and well. He's just older now. She then looked me dead in my eyes and said, when are you gonna die? Creepiest thing I've ever encountered. I have always hated my best friend's grandma's house. My friend has lived there off and on since we were probably five. At one point, she was staying there with her oldest daughter, who would have been about three or four at the time. Her daughter would draw pictures of the man and talk about seeing him in the hallway. The creepiest, though, was one night when a few of us were sitting on the porch, one summer night. One of the girls was getting ready to leave and my friend's daughter said, Laura, you don't have to be scared. The man is in your car right now, but he's not going to hurt you. We couldn't see anything in the car. Instead of leaving, literally all of us went inside to give the man some time to vacate the vehicle. Let me start by saying that growing up, my little sister never slept in our room as a child, like ever. Normally she would sleep with my mom due to her freaking out about one thing or another. To be honest, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable about sleeping in there by myself, which I did every night. Her constant freakouts about it, coupled with the feeling of being watched while I was in there alone, even in the middle of the day, made me feel super uneasy. That being said, there was one night that I came home from hanging out with my boyfriend at the time, and I walked into my room. And who do I see? My little sister. At the time, she was five and I was 15, and she was totally fine and in the top bunk. I was incredibly surprised that my mom got her to sleep in her own bed. She looks down from her bunk, and points to my great-grandmother's rocking chair. It was then that I noticed that it was slightly rocking back and forth. She laughed as she pointed and said, look, it's grandma. I immediately yelled for my mom to take her and the rocking chair out of my room. My great-grandma had died a few months before and my sister barely knew her. Without pictures, she wouldn't even know what she looked like. It was so creepy. So for slight context, I'm 22. And as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull down the clown's legs, they stretch out, the whole body does, and it plays the little music box style song as it winds itself back up. The tune slowly stops over the course of about two minutes as the clown slowly goes back up to where it started. Now, I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story setup, but stick with me. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiles back in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and into my room while I was asleep because the clown was playing its song, but it hadn't had its legs pulled down. It apparently played for about five minutes abruptly stopped and never wound down. I do remember that my mom had recorded it on her old flip phone and showed me in the morning. We found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mom. My mom is super adamant that it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I would be interested to know what you guys think.
So I was going to my sister's graduation at Binghamton University, and my family rented out a well-priced Airbnb for two nights. The only one that had five bedrooms, because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian era house, completely decked out with Victorian American aesthetics. Trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people, ornate flower wallpaper and dolls, many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms and no one in the family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious and I didn't see the room and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation. So I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. As midnight approached, I got tired even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them because you're something they've likely never encountered before. Silly thoughts. I decided to take out my black ebony handled open L pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while, turned off the lamp and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring, but my rational side told me that it was all in my head. By 3 a.m. I was half conscious, slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked. And I thought, it's okay, I have protection. I didn't dare look at the ebony handled knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered statistically, armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get stabbed to death. It was at that moment that I heard vividly in a playful childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert, like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode alert. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. The next night I thought, you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept through the night. When I was younger, I would go visit my grandparents all the time. They lived in a one floor house with an unfinished basement. I never liked it down there. It felt small for a big basement. There was a little door down there that was for storage. And I always got a horrible feeling when going close to it. Let me add that this was a newer house that was about six years old. Now, during the time that I was about six or seven, I felt so uncomfortable going down there. Even when I was with someone, I didn't like it. I remember going down there with my grandma to help with something. She had to run upstairs because someone rang the doorbell and she said she would be right back, even though she knew how I felt about being alone down there. But I nodded and said, okay. She was gone and I was alone and I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I didn't move and I didn't want to. Even though the lights were on now, it still just felt wrong. Now this is where everything started happening and it still gives me chills. The lights started to flicker and I started to hear noises and what sounded like talking. 
It wasn't coming from upstairs, though. It was coming from the storage room. I heard somebody say my name, and this is the part that really freaks me out the most. The voice sounded like my grandma, but I was confused because how am I hearing her from the storage room when she's upstairs? I didn't want to move, but me being the curious one I am, I started moving toward the storage room door. The closer I got, the worse the bad feeling became. When I got to the door, the lights turned off in the basement. I wanted to run upstairs and hide, go home somewhere that wasn't the basement. I heard my name again for the second time, my grandma's voice asking me to open the door to help her. So I did, and I regret it. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And at first, I couldn't hear anything anymore. But then I heard this faint laughing that felt like forever. But then the laughing stopped and the lights turned back on in the basement, and I felt a little bit better with them back on. On the downside, I could now see into the little storage room. I saw a small clown doll, and my grandma hates clowns with a passion and wants nothing to do with them. So why there's a clown doll, I have no idea but it was certainly not my grandma's doing. Then the lights turned on in the storage room. I saw red that looked like blood all over the place. I screamed and blacked out. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on the couch. My grandma was looking at me and asking me if I was okay. I have no idea if that was all real or if I had passed out earlier and it was some kind of dream but it sure as hell felt real. If you have any ideas as to what I experienced, let me know. So let me start with some background information first. My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items, such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman, one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans. So there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace 
And then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things. So he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll. And so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it, and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit that might be lurking inside. Okay, so this is a story that took place when I was around eight years old in my neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after school. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got into his house, his uncle was there watching the television so we couldn't use it. Today, I now know that he wasn't his uncle because my older sibling, who knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. He told us to go into his shed and search for an extra TV. So we opened the shed and started searching. We found an older television, but we couldn't use it. Then something started moving all the things around. We thought it was a rat, so at first we didn't mind. But then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter and we eventually found this one doll that was around two feet tall. It was torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We just sat it down and decided to go hook up the television we'd found in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing. But then we heard the laughter. The doll was moving around the house carefully, which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, which was probably us. We were both freaking out, but we knew we had to get away from the house. We opened the window and jumped out and ran toward my house. Somehow, the doll managed to look at us as we were running away through the window and just laugh. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents came home. Ever since that day, I've always had experiences, weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things, like clown videos. I think it's a serial commercial from the 70s. I ignored all of these weird signs for the rest of my childhood, and recently we met up for a while since departing to different high schools. Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up and I asked if he remembered all those things. He did remember, which now makes me want to share the story because apparently it wasn't just my imagination. Just three days ago, my friend and I went up to Walmart. There's this pavement trail up by my neighborhood basketball court and all of a sudden, 
three people practically materialized in front of us. We thought nothing of it at first as the trail is commonly taken. However, upon closer inspection, the people looked just like our three friends, down to the exact details. Normally, I would have no problem with this. However, one of the friends had gone to Georgia and the other one was at their house. Around this point, we got creeped out, but oh well, might as well keep going. We get about halfway up the trail and one of our friend's voices calls out. The voice was the exact cadence and tone. This is when things got weirder. My friend and I both turned to each other and asked if that was really our friend. From there, we braced ourselves for some kind of silly jump scare, turned the corner of the trail and they were gone. We kept going and saw them again, this time in a home goods parking lot along the way there. We were able to get a good look at them as we were far enough away to not be detected, but close enough to get details. I saw one of them, our younger friend of the group, was standing at an angle. I checked his face for identifiable features, but there was no face. I mean like there were no features whatsoever on his face. It terrified me. The others turned around a little bit at the same angle as they were preparing to get to the next part of the trail that led directly to Walmart. Their faces were all contorted. I mean like physically impossible kind of contorted. Then I realized they were following a particular pathway that we followed about a month ago. I mean down to foot placement, people placement, everything. It was like watching my past. They rounded the corner and we followed not far behind. They were gone entirely gone. I mean, no trace, nothing, like they didn't even exist. I brought this up with one of the friends that we supposedly encountered, and she freaked out. She was more freaked out by the fact that them taking the trail meant that they were nearby. It's sort of become a taboo topic, but I think they've followed me home. Just today, I was taking out the garbage, and down through this alleyway, there was a voice speaking to me. It was that same friend's voice, but just ever so noticeably slightly distorted. I turned and there were three figures, shrouded in shadow. Their outlines were the same as those very friends I had encountered. Needless to say, I finished taking out the trash at lightning speed. I don't really see this as anything extreme right now. I'm more so just looking for closure on what happened. I don't need anything immediately at this moment, but if anyone has an answer, and I know someone must, please let me know. A few years ago, I was part of a local paranormal investigation team. On one investigation, the client had several dolls among her possessions, many of which were in a display case in the living room. Upon arrival, we were doing a walkthrough to determine the hot spots for us to check out, decide camera placement, and to get some basic background information. While in the living room, the client invited us to check out a few specific dolls from the case that held particular interest to her. Three dolls were taken out of the case and looked at by a few of our team members. The one that caught my attention the most was wearing a dress and cape, had beautiful curly hair, and was about six inches tall. When I was done checking the doll out, I handed it back to the client to be returned to the case. After the normal settling that takes place after the doll is back in its spot and the case was closed, I started to turn away from the case. Two other team members and the client witnessed the next thing that happened. The doll reached out toward me as though it wanted me to pick it back up. I almost ran out of the house, but I reminded myself that I was there to help determine what was going on there. Some things were debunked as normal and other things were determined to be paranormal or unexplained, but that doll freaked me out.
Recently, my friend and I were recalling unexplained and possibly paranormal experiences that we've had in the past. I remembered this one that I had pushed out of my mind, honestly for good reason. Both of us are believers in the paranormal, but we also try to find a scientific and logical answer of what we've experienced before we jump to a paranormal explanation. However, neither of us were able to reach a logical conclusion on what I'm about to describe. Firstly, a bit of backstory. The house I grew up in was in a neighborhood almost completely surrounded by forest and greenery. While that sounds like it would be tranquil, it was not. Myself and other friends of mine have felt very uneasy walking through those woods, even in the daytime. And not just the usual, I feel like someone's following me feeling that you sometimes do get in forests or other areas like that. It felt like someone was watching you from the second you stepped into the woods. My house was on a street extremely close to the forest. It was about a two minute walk from my house to the main trail. Off the main trail, you were immediately met by thick forest. There were a few small clearings before the huge open field behind the forest itself. So it would take a long time to fight your way through the large forest before getting there. Very few people would make the trek out there, so I could always almost guarantee that every time I went out there, I would be able to enjoy the nature in serene isolation. In the warmer months of the year, I liked to spend my free time walking through the forest, especially in fall when the leaves had all turned orange and red, just before they would start to fall from the trees. This story takes place on one of those fall days. I had been walking through the forest listening to music with my earbuds in for at least a couple of hours. The last time I had run into anyone else was about an hour prior, as per usual, for my walks. Even though I knew that I was probably very alone apart from wildlife, I remember still not being able to shake the feeling that someone was very close to me. The sun was also setting, so any sane person would be heading home by now anyways. After walking for a while longer, I decided to eventually start heading back in the direction of the main trail. By this time, the sun was barely still out, and it was getting dark pretty fast. I had almost made it to a pretty nice clearing, but there was no way in hell that I was going to go there only to have to walk home in the dark in the forest, especially since I was already very unsettled. As I turned around to head back toward home, I heard a voice, muffled by the music playing in my earbuds, come from behind me. I had been in very deep thought for a few minutes, so I was a bit startled, but assumed that I had accidentally spoken out loud to myself. Before I could even take a couple steps further, I heard someone speak again. Fully aware of my surroundings now, I froze dead in my tracks, my heart pounding as I took my right earbud out and sharply turned around to see who was behind me. I was horrified to see a person standing with their back toward me, looking off into the distance. Everything about them was so familiar, and it took me a couple of seconds to come to the horrifying realization that I was staring into the back of myself. It was wearing my dark navy and white plaid jacket, the black hood of the very hoodie that I was wearing resting on the collar of my jacket. Even my same short, blonde, unkempt hair with its brassy undertones shining in the last bit of light left from the setting sun. And then it spoke again, in my voice. It's not too far ahead now. My exact voice, cadence, tone, everything. It took me a second to snap out of the paralyzing fear I was in and book it home. I didn't try to speak to whatever it was. I just ran as fast as I could to the main trail and out of the forest. As I ran, I could have sworn that I heard someone chasing me the whole way out of the forest, which might have just been a product of being hyper aware of my surroundings and my state of fear, but I didn't dare look behind me, because I was terrified of what I might have seen if I did. After nearly tripping and falling on branches and stumps a million times, I tore out of the forest and onto the road adjacent to my street. I kept running until I was on the complete opposite side of the road from the edge of the forest. I turned around and the only thing I saw were the bushes and branches I'd pushed through on my way out, springing back into their natural place. 
I stood there staring at the forest for a minute before heading home, in fear that whatever it was would pop out, but I saw nothing. I didn't go back into the woods for some time after that, and almost every returning visit I brought a friend with me. My friend told me she has also had odd experiences in those woods, and so has her sister. They have both seen tall, dark figures standing in the woods when they took walks together. One of them would see the figure, say nothing about it to the other one, and then book it out of the forest together. I had seen similar figures, but I had just always written it off as seeing shadows from bigger trees, my mind playing tricks on me, things like that. I had blocked this out of my memory for a long time, until my friend had brought up her strange experiences in the forest, and how she constantly felt uneasy in it. Still to this day, years later, I cannot come up with a rational or scientific explanation for what I saw, and I've had little luck looking online for answers, too. Either way, it was by far the craziest thing I've ever experienced. This happened when I was about nine or 10 years old, and I was really into soft stuffed animals. My step grandma was rich and pretty close with my sisters and I and lived close to us. So we would see her and my grandpa quite often and she spoiled us. We went to a store, not a secondhand store or anything, but I don't remember what store it was. There was a shelf of lambs with cute outfits covered in plastic flowers with what I think was actual wool covering them. They were very cute and soft, and I immediately knew that I had to have one. I asked my grandma and she gave it to me. I was delighted and I brought the lamb everywhere I went for a while. After a few days, I sat the lamb on top of a little toy chest at the foot of my bed. One morning, I was asleep, but I woke up to the sun streaming in on my face. I looked around my room and my lamb was pacing around next to my bed. It looked like it didn't have much control over its limbs, so it was kind of stumbling. It circled around and eventually it was facing me. It looked me in the face and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up later and the lamb was where I had left it, sitting on the toy chest at the foot of my bed. I was so afraid that I buried the lamb under all of my other stuffed animals inside the toy chest, and I tried my very best to never look at it. A few years later, my grandma died of leukemia, and I felt extra guilty about the lamb, since it was a gift from her. But I told my mom about what happened, and she said I should just get rid of it. I donated the lamb to Goodwill, so hopefully it's not actually possessed because then I just made it someone else's problem. Probably everyone reading this is convinced that it was just a dream. And you're probably right. But if it was, it was one of the most vivid dreams I have ever had. It took place in my bed, where I was lying down. My messy room had all the same things sitting on the floor, as in real life. And every time I saw the lamb after it happened, I got a weird feeling and just got really uneasy and sick. It could have been a dream, but it was so creepy that it still freaks me out to this day. When I was around seven, I got this stuffed animal named Sparky. I slept with Sparky every night and would carry her around everywhere. Anyway, a few years ago, one random day, I just couldn't stand to be around her. Every time I was, I would get super cold and I would get this really bad feeling. So I left her behind my bed for a few months and eventually I forgot about her. Then, when I finally got her from behind the bed, she seemed normal again. That was a few years ago. She's beside me right now, and she's normal. 
I randomly thought a few minutes ago about when she seemed off. So I asked my pendulum if she had a spirit or something attached to her a few years ago, and it said yes. Also, I asked if it was an evil spirit, and the pendulum said yes. I just thought that was interesting, so I wanted to share. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls. They were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift-giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So, of course, some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad, though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old but very pleasant to have around was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then, there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by, so when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. Dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before. I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued though, getting worse over the next several nights until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow, I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening and that I thought it was the boy and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asks him what was wrong, and he points at the door and says, Mama, who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day, and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone, and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck whoever bought him. I think my son has a double. The first time this happened was when he was three. My older sister was staying in my apartment and watching TV in her room when my son walked in. 
She asked him if he wanted to watch cartoons and put some on for him. He just sat quietly at the end of her bed while she tried to get his attention. Then she hears him laugh in the other room with me. When she looks to the bedroom door, the copy of my son disappeared. When she told me this, I honestly assumed that she was high and just imagined it. The second time, a friend was visiting from the UK. They got up at night to use the restroom and saw my son's door was wide open, lights on, and he was sitting at his little table with a friend. He told me about this in the morning and thought it was kind of weird since it had been three o'clock in the morning. My son wasn't in his room that night and no other children were present. I rationalized it as him being tired and imagining it. The third time was when my son was around eight. My best friend and roommate, new apartment, different state, got up to go to the bathroom. The hall light was off and it was dark, but she saw my son standing in the hall next to her. She told him to go back to bed and step into the bathroom. She then sees him in the mirror standing behind her. She says, stop it, go to bed. My son then turns and walks away. That's when she realized something was wrong and looked back into the hall, but he wasn't there. She goes to his room and he was still asleep. She ran to my room to tell me. And for the first time I thought, okay, there seems to be a pattern here. Maybe there is something going on. The last time was when my son was 15 and this time I saw it. I was in bed depressed and tired after having had a miscarriage. I woke up to my son curled up in bed next to me. I thought he was trying to comfort me, which was sweet. I sang a lullaby to him and pet his hair before it clicked. My son was 15 now. This was him at age seven or eight. I froze and asked who he was. He just said, everything's gonna be okay. And then got up and left. Everyone just assumed that it was blood loss that made me hallucinate, but I was not hallucinating. I was wide awake and I didn't have any other experiences like that. No one has seen my son's double in five years, but I still think it is super weird. months ago, I purchased this doll. I found it at a Goodwill store and I purchased it as a Halloween decoration. Ever since, I've got some really off-putting issues going on. I started to notice whenever I had it out, like when I bought it and set it on my dresser, I would have nightmares. And I just had this weird feeling, so I would shove it in the drawer when I woke up in the night. One night, I had sleep paralysis. This happens to me every now and then, but this was the first and only time it ever involved another person. In my sleep paralysis, as I stared paralyzed at the wall, I heard a voice say, wake up you two. I instantly got chills and eventually was able to get up and realized that I had put him back on the dresser. I've never been so scared. Even with all of this, it still felt like a fluke or just me psyching myself out until tonight. Tonight, my family and I were moving out. For three months, we'd had some dry flowers hanging from a pot rack in the kitchen. I pulled this puppet out of my drawer because I was emptying it, and I put it in the garage. At 6.50, we left the house to take the second truckload. Nothing abnormal. At 10.12, we got back home to find the flowers that had been in the same place for months on the floor. I told the people who helped me move. Later, my cousin sent me a picture he had taken of the puppet. I didn't realize they were playing and messing with him downstairs. When I looked at it, I realized that the flowers had fallen almost if not exactly where my cousin had taken that photo. Please advise. Maybe I'm just psyching myself out, but this is really weird.
Let me start off by saying that my family and I have always thought of this to be a super strange phenomenon. But to this day, I have never been able to understand what the heck happened. When we were younger, our cousin Daniela always talked to us about how these two dolls she had were possessed and plotting to kill her. Well, one of the dolls belongs to her, and the other was a porcelain Tinkerbell doll that belonged to her older sister. They shared a room, by the way. We never paid mind to it because she had a wild imagination. Fast forward into months, maybe even a year, into her telling us these stories. One weekend, my older sister and I stayed over at her house. It was four of us upstairs playing in their room, and we knew to stay on Daniela's side of the room and away from her older sister's side. It was a small room though, and we were children, so we didn't listen. Somewhere in the middle of being all over the place, we knock down the Tinkerbell doll and it completely shatters. Immediately, we all freak out because we were told by our aunt to stay away from that side of the room and we completely disobeyed her. Not to mention, my aunt was terrifying, so we knew we were in for a beating. We try to think of ways to fix it, but there was no way. It was completely shattered. So, realizing we're screwed, we start crying. We go downstairs and, in tears, we apologize to our aunt for disobeying her and breaking the doll. She starts yelling at us and then decides to go upstairs and clean up our mess. Well, here's where things get weird. Once she gets upstairs, she starts screaming at us again, but this time she's calling us liars. We run upstairs and come to find out that the doll isn't shattered. It's completely intact and back to where it was before. We immediately look at each other with our jaws dropped. It was then that my cousin Daniela went from being scared with us to almost being relieved and starts saying, I told you guys I wasn't crazy. The doll's possessed. I told you, I told you. The rest of us ran out of that room and called for our parents to come and get us. After that day, we refused to go back in that house. My aunt has always been a lover of creepy things. She likes gory, spooky, haunted things. She's sort of the lovable oddball of the family. She's always been crazy about these things called living dead dolls. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're just terrifying looking collectible dolls, basically purchasable nightmare fuel. She had bought a bunch of them and had them on display in her home. I've never been a fan of dolls, let alone ones meant to be scary. So this story creeps me out a lot. She ran into some financial trouble and decided to start selling things on eBay to make some extra cash for bills. As much as it broke her heart, she decided to sell one of her more popular Living Dead dolls on eBay. Almost immediately after she posted her doll, there was an offer. She said her goodbyes, boxed up the doll, and mailed it. No problem. A week or so later, she got the box back in the original packaging she sent it out in, but with a note saying undeliverable address, meaning she must have written it down wrong or it wasn't an acceptable place to deliver a package. My aunt figured it was just a spelling error and didn't think anything of it. She didn't open the package, she just put it in her closet. She went on eBay to try and contact the buyer. To her surprise, when she logged on, she already had a message from the buyer saying how she got the doll and how much she loved it and couldn't wait to brush its hair. She also described the doll in correct detail. My aunt was pretty freaked out. To this day, she still hasn't opened the package. It's just sitting in her closet. Edit. As a special Christmas gift, 
my aunt finally let me open the box. The doll was in it.